We are live. Welcome to Star Wars Episode 2 Review and Thoughts Film Attack of the Clones. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, a movie focused too much on a romance with no pulse, excessive fan service, and a meh mystery. So I mentioned in my review for The Phantom Menace that one thing I do love about this movie is how deliciously 1950s sci-fi movie the title is, which was something that George Lucas was going for. That was one of the many inspirations for Star Wars right from the start. So that these videos don't get to be too negative, I will now list other positive things about Attack of the Clones. Number one, it has an ending. I don't mean an actual conclusion to the story, I mean the fact that despite how it may feel while you are watching, eventually this movie does actually end. Oh, there is no number two, that's it. I'm kidding. I do think this movie does some things right, like it does a pretty good job handling the political aspect, and I will be sprinkling in positive statements about the movie through the rest of this video. I don't like making videos that are primarily negative anymore, especially not ones where I'm ranting angrily. It was fun for a while, but it's not what I want to do anymore. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries. That means episodes 4 through 6 and 1, even though... You know, three of those are set later, but they were released earlier. That's why I'm spoiling them in this franchise. And, you know, there are a lot of things that makes more sense for you to talk about in Star Wars if you're comparing the prequels to the original trilogy, which was what, you know, that, yeah, George Lucas made. He says that these six movies are supposed to be watched, you know, it's it's one story. It's one entire story over six movies. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the subject, as well as for earlier entries in the franchise. Again, not for later entries in the franchise, and I will be discussing the ending. I will be spoiling everything once I get into the thoughts section. Now, let's see. so yeah, there are several major appeals of comic books and adaptations of them, and stuff heavily inspired by them, which... Star Wars is, one of them is that they can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other, magic power versus robots, for example. Outside of comics and other adaptations, we'll only have a few at a time. And yeah, this movie does do that. And another major appeal with their wild concepts, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than non-comic stuff. And... I think this movie does want to do that. You know what? On politics, I think it comes close. I I don't know if... I, I would not say that that works for the romance aspect. Now, content warning and or trigger warning, I will... You know, the, yeah, the movie features the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Torture, ableism and disability, gaslighting, mental illness, xenophobia, death, body horror, and... So, the movie is rated PG, and so is this video. And this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, like clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. Other movies in the Star Wars franchise, including the other ones made by George Lucas. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. I'm not one of the people who thinks that George Lucas, I'm not going to use that word, but destroyed my childhood. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it's trying to achieve, etc. 
And once again, in a lot of ways, this movie is like episodes four through six and especially episode one. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that are different from one another. So I'm not just repeating myself. And yeah, in order to follow this movie's plot, you will have to have watched The Phantom Menace. And I'm glad that's the case because it does, you know, it, it, it gives the movie a stronger impact when it, it makes it more efficient in the way it comments on the political situ situation that led to the rise of Hitler. Now, since we're still, in, st still dealing with Corona, I want to say, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, the... I base this review, or yeah, this entire video on the version of the movie that's on Disney Plus. That's the one I watched most recently. It's been a couple of years at least since I last watched this. I think I watched the entire prequel trilogy right before I watched Black Panther because there's a scene in the trailer of Black Panther. Oh wait, Black Panther. Or am I thinking? I might be thinking of Infinity War because that's where you. I am not entirely sure. I think it's, I, yeah, thinking about it. I must, it must be Infinity War. Anyway, because there's this, you know, there's this one bit in the trailer that looks like something in one of the prequels. And, yeah, I ended up just watching all three of them. So I don't remember 100% what the, what the DVD version is. I do own the DVD. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what the differences are. There, there must be some, because I did compare the the running time, and there is a bit of a difference. So, but, but yeah. I want to say three or four minutes or so. But, but yeah, so, you know, if I bring something up that wasn't in your version, you know, we watch two different versions of the movie. And, I mean, I think, yeah, again, I, I don't remember, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the differences are, but, yeah, I would say both the DVD, I'm, I'm talking about the, the like, I, I'll do a real quick check to see, yeah, apparently this DVD did come out in 2002, so, you know, if you've bought one since, it they might have made changes in the time in between, since we do know George Lucas likes to change things for these movies, but yeah, I you know I would say if if you if you want to watch the movie, either version would be fine. I have watched this somewhere like two or three dozens of times, and my first viewing was in two thousand two in theaters. This was actually the first Star Wars movie chronologically released where that is the case. I also watched Revenge of the Sith in theaters. I do not know why I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there. And yeah, my... Let's see. yeah, this is one of those movies that I've owned for a really long time. First time I watched it was a number of years ago. I've watched it a bunch of times over the years. It made a really strong impression on me. I've been wanting to talk about it on camera for a long time. And the most recent viewing was like, I, I guess maybe 20 minutes ago the end credits ended rolling on my most recent viewing. So, the plot. Following the events of The Phantom Menace, Padme Amidala has retired as queen and is now a senator. And, you know, the, it's, it's basically so that she can have political influence even though she can no longer be the queen of Naboo. They briefly talk about in the movie that, you know, she, she served her full term, and they were, they liked her being the queen so much that they tried to amend, I, do they say the constitution? I'm gonna go with constitution, but that didn't end up happening, so yeah, she became the senator for Naboo instead. She's fighting to keep the Senate from creating an army of the Republic, something she feels will hurt democracy. When someone attempts to assassinate her, Obi-Wan Kenobi goes off to investigate what's going on, while Anakin Skywalker, now 
a teenager or barely adult, I guess he's supposed to be around 19, probably, in this movie, is there to protect her from future attacks. But the two of them start to develop feelings, which is not allowed according to Jedi Code. And yes, for, for some reason, after there is incontrovertible evidence that Padme has been targeting targeted by an assassin, she and others continue to take huge risks with her safety. Now, Obi-Wan Kenobi investigating has a very film noir in space feel, which, like many, I guess most, of those instances of bringing in very distinct genres and their tropes works really well for a Star Wars movie. How noir? I somehow hear you ask. Following a trail of events to a mysterious rain-soaked location where a lot of dialogue and exposition takes place, it even has multiple characters who suspect each other trying to gauge how much each other know without giving anything away themselves. It really, like, if you've ever watched, if you've watched this movie but not a noir movie, or a noir movie but not this movie, like, it's almost worth watching, I, I mean, yeah, pick a noir movie. I'm not sure I've ever, I, I guess hypothetically bad ones exist. I've, I've never watched a bad noir, like, okay, off the top of my head, The Big Sleep, the Postman Always Rings Twice, Double Indemnity, The Maltese Falcon, I can't believe it, I'm, I'm certain there's one more, maybe I'll think of it later. Any of these, any, any of those, just, they're all amazing. You know, you can't go wrong with Bogart. You know, watch, if, even if you don't think noir is going to be your thing, just just try to try to note all the things where the, the film where a noir movie has stuff similar to, to Star Wars. And if you if you find you can barely get through a Star Wars movie, especially a prequel movie, you know, you can just watch those scenes. But but yeah, it's like it is wild. When I when I watched this the first time, I don't think I'd watched any noir by then. So when I watched it later and then I went back and watched this movie, I was like, holy crap, this is George Lucas likes his noir, clearly. And I, I'm going to keep it vague here. People who've watched the movie might guess what I'm going, what I'm getting at. But for those who who haven't, I'm not going to spoil it in this section of the movie. Lucas gives many fans something they may have wanted, in spite of there being absolutely no basis for it, and sacrifices it making sense in doing so. And. The plot isn't that engaging, and things that ought to be in episode three are here and vice versa. Like the the relationship between Anakin and Obi Wan in this movie feels like it belongs in episode three, and the way the relationship is in episode three feels like it belonged here. Like you can tell that George Lucas didn't sit down and figure out everything for for how it you know I. It seems like he kind of planned one movie at a time, which, fair enough. So did Disney for the sequel trilogy. But it really, it, George Lucas for sure had a, had more of a plan. But then, you know, with, with the prequel trilogy, of course, he's going to end up where, in, in roughly the same... I'm not going to get into that in this video. I'm going to get into it in the Revenge of the Sith video. And, yeah, the, the he goes a little too close to the ending in this one and then has to reel it back for episode three so that it's, you know, slightly more believable, you know, uh, these movies would have been substantially better if he had someone who was willing to say no helping with the scripts because this is something that like you know and and a good ah let me think for when you write a book pu publisher editor I forget I, I want to say editor a good editor would pick these things up would be like you're pushing a little bit too fast you're, you're going too fast you're pushing a little bit too far Reel it back a little. We'll get there. You know we'll get there. It just, yeah. And the movie does, you know, the, the 
the action and adventure goes to to like there's there's more action and adventure in this than you would find in you know the original trilogy or other stuff from back then simply you know move, movies could move faster by this point production on movies could get bigger and such and yeah like the the fact that it contains so much is is legitimately impressive even though i think there are a number of things about the movie that don't completely work and yeah since i will be criticizing a number of aspects of, about this and the, the prequel trilogy in general i do want to underline i do really love episodes four and five and i do respect what these movies like by all rights this should not have worked at all like basically the 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 amount of time that passed between lucas directing you know the, the did he actually i forget did he direct anything at all between a new hope and phantom menace i'm not entirely sure he did and just the the like a lot of a lot of people would not a, a lot of filmmakers would not have been able to keep up with all the the improvements in special effects you know and the the some filmmakers would have had trouble keeping the the film moving fast they would they would keep insisting that it should only move as fast as like you know when they were younger and and yeah there there are a lot of things about these movies that are legitimately impressive and that brings us to right so the writing and yeah this was written by Lucas himself and Jonathan Hales and there are some improvements in the writing from the Phantom Menace. George Lucas thankfully took in some of the feedback and you know the the for some of it it would have been nice if more of it was reacted to but he definitely did some some of the the biggest problems with with Phantom Menace he does go move away from in this. I think I might have forgotten saying in my video on The Phantom Menace, but I do think overall it is probably the best of the prequel trilogy, which obviously doesn't mean that it's a good movie. It's not. And I think this might be the worst of the three. Maybe all, all six, of, of all six Lucas written ones, I think this might be the worst one. The terrible handling of the romance. Does George Lucas not understand how and why people fall in love? In this, it feels like he's reciting a half-remembered lesson from many years ago where he can only remember broad strokes. And I do mean lesson, like he studied it in high school or something. Like he, like, like his high school teacher made him analyze a Shakespeare, you know, like, like Romeo and Juliet or something. And, you know, when he got to writing this movie, he's like, ah, what was it? What did Miss June say about romance? Okay, so you gotta say nice things in this really ridiculous, exaggerated way, and you gotta have like drama and like just threat of death and all that. And just yeah, it it's anyway. Where was I? Right, bad things. The fan service, the just bombastic over like overpowering action I think this might be the hardest hit of all of the Star Wars movies that George Lucas wrote as far as bad dialogue goes he, you see he has to establish and develop some things for Anakin Skywalker falling in love with Padme struggling with feeling he isn't powerful enough and that it's because Obi-Wan is intentionally holding him back his fears about his mother's safety his belief that a dictatorship might be better than a democracy. Now these are not necessarily bad on their own. In fact, other than the, you know, dictatorship better than democracy thing, these are perfectly normal things for a teenager to experience. 
you know, most of them probably don't have a mentor named Obi-Wan specifically, but, you know, I, I mean, even, like, Padme has a great line about our mentors have a way of seeing more of our faults than we would like. So, you know, clearly Lucas understands that this, you know, some of this is really universal stuff. No, the problem is that George Lucas bafflingly felt that he could deal with all of the negative ones whilst Anakin and Padme fall in love. And it is impossible to believe as an audience member that she would gradually fall in love with him as he is whining in an extremely immature and grating, obnoxious way, in a huge contrast to how emotionally mature she was in the first movie when she was 14 years old and the queen of a planet. And she's even more mature in this one. At one point, he actually disregards her own significant experience and knowledge base, and she rightly calls him out for it, but somehow still falls for him. If you want him to not hide his darkness, then at least have him be confident about it, instead of whining about it. And there are actually, there are times when he does come across as more confident about it, and those work a lot better. Some people do retain sympathy for people who whine, try to empathize with them, but no one likes hearing whining, f you know, yeah, from, let's see, lost track of my notes, right, yeah, yeah, no one likes hearing whining from others, you know, and, you know, he's talking up a dictatorship, the very thing that she as a senator is devoting her life to preventing at all costs. While she is targeted for assassination, you know, the kind of thing someone faces when fighting against dictatorships. And i just like to note here, in Shattered Glass, Hayden Christensen gives an incredible performance. In parts of that movie, he is extremely whiny, but it's right for that movie, not for this one. And when he is whining, other people react accordingly. They aren't falling in love with him. Really, it was necessary for this movie to have him hide those things from her, have him be much smoother when talking with her. You know, I, I think it would, I don't think it would have been that difficult. You just, you just gotta have, like, every so often, like, you know, he'll say, he'll, he'll be confident and smooth when talking to her, and she'll, like, smile as he does that, maybe turn to face away, and, like, as she's facing away from him, he gets like this dark look in his eye where we can tell there's something more going on, but he's hiding it. That kind of thing. But don't have him whine to her and then her respond by falling in love with him. That just, it doesn't work at all. The, the, yeah. And in addition to whining, he also comes off as kind of a creep. He's constantly violating her personal space, talking about how attracted he is to her, how much he's thought about her all these years, you know, since he was nine and she was 14. And he had a crush on her while she was kind of nurturing and motherly towards him. It really doesn't help that the two actors have absolutely no romantic chemistry together, despite how charming he can be, especially in movies other than this one and like I've seen I've seen Natalie Portman have great romantic chemistry with you know a male lead that she's supposed to be falling in love with in other movies but just not here and like I read that George Lucas liked the way they looked together or something like that and you just you just wish he had focused more on do they yeah, do they come across as if they actually like being around each other? That they actually are, you know, in a in a situation where they could hypothetically fall in love with each other. It seems like the movie at times realizes the tension between Anakin and the characters around him that, that he bothers with the way that he behaves, since there are, like... Off the top of my head, I can think of, I guess, ultimately it's maybe only two scenes, but those are really also the only ones where it could have happened, where we get multiple reaction shots of other characters that clearly understand how bad of an impression he's making. 
honestly, when the two discuss politics, their acting comes across as very natural. It seems to me that both actors, you know, for like, okay, I guess not for once, there's maybe one or two other spots in the movie, but it's the rare occurrence, it's, it's the, yeah, the rare occurrence in the movie where the two actors completely understand and believe the lines that they're delivering. I'm not saying Hayden Christensen is actually in favor of a dictatorship. I'm saying he understands people who are more than he understands someone who would say the quote-unquote romantic things that his character does. Yes, I 100% understand why it appeals to some people that the romance is forbidden. They're star-crossed lovers. Natalie Portman says in an interview that Padme folds for Anakin because he allows her to be less serious about herself. They can laugh together, and I do think that comes across in the movie. It, it's not, it's still not completely convincing, but you can tell that, like, sometimes in interview, like, an actor will say something, and it won't be 100% the truth. It's just that they're trying to make something about the movie sound better than it is. But here, it does seem like she actually feels that that's part of, that, that that's something that works about the romance. And yeah, I, I think so too. When, when I watched the, the, I think it was on the DVD, when I, so, you know, I watched it, I forget, I guess by now, a couple of weeks ago, I prepare for some of these videos weeks ahead. But when I watched that, I was like, is that really, you know what, maybe, and I wrote it down. And yeah, now having just watched the movie, yeah, I, I, that, that does, that does come across. It's like Lucas's idea of what love and romance is based on Shakespeare. It doesn't come across as natural. Yeah, I already said some of that. And the, you know, there's this kind of superficial idea of falling in love where, like, the scenes where they fall in love with each other, you know, they're in beautiful places, they're having romantic experiences, they're physically attractive, like hair, makeup, all, all of this stuff, you know, but it, I, it feels like the, the, the CG animators genuinely do think that these scenes depict two people falling in love, you know, and if only while directing the movie, Lucas, you know, would would watch the playback and see and, and just realize the actors aren't selling it. The actors are, are like, he used to genuinely believe that a special effect is only as good as the story around it. And by the time he made these prequels, it seems like he reversed his opinion on that it really the the way he tries to get the the these characters to say and do things to progress the story it feels like he just he, he has an idea of where he wants the story to go and he doesn't think about if it makes sense for the characters and the these poor actors having to struggle through this this completely just hopeless dialogue and and uh, some of the other material as well I want to preface the following by saying I don't believe in shaming someone for wearing something they want as long as it's not like an issue of dressing appropriately at your workplace or you know uh, what what's the what's the term again I forget the term, but, you know, there are, like, there are a number of, you know, there are parts of your body you're not allowed to show in public. So, I want to, yeah, shaming people for what they wear is not what I'm doing when I say that what Padme wears during their scenes together isn't what I would expect someone to wear if they are actively trying to avoid you know, romance, I'm not judging her. I'm saying that the people who made that decision on filmmaking level are, by making that choice, contradicting her character, stating that she does not want to fall in love. And this movie really did not need yet another aspect where the characters will say one thing and do another to the point where little, if anything, feels real. And I'm not talking about 
real in the real world sense. I mean authentic to their own universe. Jill Barrop, who does excellent videos on the entire prequel trilogy and many other things, points out that the actors in the romance put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, and yeah, that's definitely a problem. It's it's like it is it is off-putting like it, it, the movie keeps you at, at arm's length when when some yeah sometimes the the like Hayden Christensen gives some of the most memorably off line reads at, at times in this there's there's one bit where like the line is it's overkill master and for some reason he says it's over kill master and I like when I was a child, I was like, did he say Killmaster? Is that what he said? And it's just, it's, yeah. Anyway. And right. According to IMDb Trivia, the entire aggressive negotiations conversation between Anakin and Padme was ad libbed by Hit Christensen and Natalie Portman at George Lucas's request due to his not being happy with the romantic dialogue he wrote for that scene. I 100% believe that because when they're having that conversation, they do like yeah, it it comes across as very natural, and I just I really wish I I forget which movie no yeah actually yeah I believe it was the original trilogy where the the yeah you know Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, R.I.P. and Harrison Ford, they basically rewrote their lines to convey the same information, but to make it something that they could say and make it convincing. And I wish he had kept that, like, I, I wish that that was how he approached the prequels, that he just said, you know what, I'll admit it, I'm not the best at writing dialogue, so what's in the script that's the that's the information I want you to convey with your lines. I want you to have freedom to change your lines if you feel like you can't say it like that and make it work. I've seen some critics say that it does make sense the Jedi Let's see. Right, the, the, yeah, the, the, how, you know, in, in this movie, I'm, I'm not sure it's been said before, but, so, I just want to say it since this is the review part, this is the part for people who haven't watched the movie yet, in this movie, it is stated, Jedi are forbidden from loving at least an individual, you know, the, the, they are not allowed to have a romantic partner, and that's part of the problem that these two are facing and I've seen some say well then how do they procreate and I th yeah the the person who said that does go on to say maybe they don't procreate maybe you know maybe they increase their numbers by recruiting I think that is supposed to be the idea they they recruit and I'm not saying that necessarily makes the most sense but I'm pretty sure that was the idea from George Lucas, like maybe there's a system where if you as a parent see that your sm very small child has force abilities, you can choose to contact the Jedi and ask them to train your kid as a Jedi. I'm not saying it makes the most sense, but I don't think there's necessarily a problem for the mythology in that the Jedi don't have romantic relationships, apparently. Uh, you know, I... I've, Let's see, there's, you know, in, in the real world, we do have, like, if you realize that you're a very small child, you know, like, let's say, the, the you know, you, you see signs that your very small child is maybe on the spectrum. You know, there are people you can talk to, there's, you know, to, to get help to, to make sure, you know, that your child does as well as, as possible. You know, I, I I think that is supposed to be the idea in, in these movies. I don't think the idea is that there are actually Jedi fathers and sons. And, and 
mothers and daughters for that matter. I, that's, although, you know, there really aren't that many female Jedi in these movies. Come on, George. It's, it's a new millennium. You, we're, you know, w women can wield lightsabers too. Despite what certain fans think about that. The, the, but, but yeah, I, I, it's, I think the idea is supposed to be that they don't, you know, they're not supposed to think of any, like, if you're a Jedi Padawan or a Jedi Master, you're not supposed to look at any other Padawan or Master as the one you're related to by blood. You're supposed to think of all of them. Uh, you know, it's it's like a it's like a commune kind of thing. You know, the the they're all equal. Of the you know, there's there's rank obviously, but other than that, you you shouldn't favor your own father, son, mother, daughter, and you know that is something. Again, I don't, I don't think it's the healthiest thing to do, but I don't know that this movie is really saying that it's healthy. It's just saying that's how, that's how they do things. The pitch meeting says that the romance makes up most of the movie. I mean, in a lot of those scenes, other things are happening, although that is part of the problem. Yeah, no, it, it, a lot of the movie is, is, it is these, these two, like, they're good actors, but they're given such bad material, and they're not a good pair, and I, honestly, it might be, when, yeah, when, when I think about how much they sometimes smile when the, the, ah, what's the word, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll talk to, to each other and they'll they'll smile and they'll sometimes come across as very natural. I think Natalie Portman when when they were filming this, I think she believed that Padme might see Anakin as a friend. I'm not sure she completely bought the idea that Padme thought of Anakin as a romantic partner and sometimes that comes across like they can yeah, you know, they, they'll have a conversation that you could also have with a friend, but then when they're supposed to be falling in love, you know, like, she does what it says in the script, but she feels like it's, it feels off to her, and she can't completely hide that in her performance, and I wish she had the confidence to, to talk to Lucas and say, I don't think this is completely convincing, but I, I think she was just too, too young and inexperienced. Like she was, it was a huge deal for her to be cast in these movies, and she really didn't want to, like, you know, maybe she was worried it would be like overstepping her bounds or something. And yeah, I, I maybe part of the reason that the romance lacks credibility. You know, there were there are some deleted scenes that help make it, you know, but that stuff was cut, so when you just watch the movie, it's not completely, yeah. And at times the dialogue, dialogue gets to be downright painful. And Roger Ebert, RIP, stated about Anakin and Padme's relationship, there is not a romantic word they exchange that has not long since been reduced to cliché. And numerous critics characterized the dialogue as stiff and flat. The acting was also disparaged by some critics. And actually, after the mixed critical reception to The Phantom Menace, Lucas was hesitant to return to the writing desk. In March 2000, just three months before the start of principal photography, Lucas finally completed his rough draft for episode 2. Lucas continued to iterate on his rough draft, producing a proper first and second draft. For up with the third draft, which would later become the shooting script, Lucas brought on Jonathan Hales, who had written several episodes of the young Indiana Jones Chronicles for him, but had limited experience writing theatrical films. The final script was completed just one week before the start of principal photography, and that does also show the the 
some of the actors, like the, the way they deliver lines, it doesn't come across. Like, ideally, when you watch a movie, unless someone's under mind control, when a character says a line, you should buy as an audience member that person thought of that and is delivering it and and like either believes what they're saying or they're like intentionally like trying to lie or something but there are times in this movie where it feels like the lines they ju they only read them very recently they didn't have time to f like make their line feel natural to them you know like it's there, there's. I, I want to say, was it Anthony Hopkins who likes to read his dialogue over and over and and kind of, you know, memorize it very carefully and go over and figure out exactly how he's going to deliver a line before they start shooting, you know. And that's the kind of thing. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not sure he would have been allowed to do that if he was in this movie either. But the, yeah, it it would have helped a lot. A lot of the characters, when you know. Not all of the time, but a lot of the time when they'll say a line, it will not feel like that was something that character thought of, and especially not thought of just now. And some things that... I, I get it. I completely understand. I just, I wish he had brought in someone to start writing before he himself felt comfortable with it and then they could go over it after but but yeah there you know the a, a huge part of this movie is this mystery you know who is trying to assassinate senator amidala and like i've wa like i said i've watched this movie maybe 30 times by now i still don't 100 percent follow the mystery because it isn't made completely clear and I'm not like I'm not criticizing the movie for something I don't understand I'm criticizing the movie because it doesn't communicate it completely properly like I have I have done some reading to to fully understand and yeah you know there is some expanded universe that's what it's called there's some expanded universe stuff that helps explain this you know, I've, I've, I'm told that some stuff in the Clone Wars animated show, yeah, that you know, help explain some of the some of the things that this movie doesn't completely explain. And I'm glad that there is an explanation, but I do think it should be in the movie. And that's a big problem with these prequels is that, like, you can watch. If you just watch, like, obviously, yeah, if you just watch episode four or, you know, the, the entire original trilogy, obviously, if you try to just watch episode five and you haven't watched episode four, yeah, you're going to be confused. But you can watch those movies and there's, there's mythology that you aren't given a lot of information on. There are characters where you don't know everything about them, but you understand the general, like, okay... In this movie, this happens, and then the other movie, that happens, in part because of what happened in the first one, and then later, and then, you know, okay, some stuff happened off screen, but I understand. Like, in episode five, Han Solo says something along the lines of, I was going to stay here, but that run-in at, what was it, Ord Mantell or something like that, with the bounty hunter changed my mind. We don't know, we're not told in the original trilogy what happened with that bounty hunter but we don't need to know the exact details we just need to know something happened between movies and that's why Han is now you know has has changed his mind on on something important and that's the kind of thing that just in this movie sometimes they will say you know oh it's because of this this and this but it'll be so vague that we don't completely understand and sometimes they just don't say anything at all. Like, I I have to admit, I didn't even pick up on this myself, but I, I, I've been watching YouTube videos and such in preparation for this, and other people analyzing this movie, and someone pointed out, Amidala, you know, when she's talking, when she's trying to tell Anakin, we cannot fall in love, she says, you're a Jedi, which 
we understand they're not allowed to love one person. And then she goes on to say, I'm a senator. And the movie never really explains what the problem is there. Like, maybe in this, maybe in the Star Wars galaxy, senators are also not allowed to have one partner. But the movie doesn't say that. Like, hypothetically, it could be that, like, a thousand years ago, you know, a, a prophet made a prophecy that said that if a senator and a Jedi were together, the, you know, Coruscant would explode from the inside out. But we don't know that from watching the movie, so, you know, it, it could be almost anything. And it is just the, just, just having a tiny bit more. And, and also, I don't, I don't think it really even, like, the fact that he's a Jedi, that's enough. You really don't need anything else, but... I think it's the the fact that, again, I I think Lucas got the idea from Romeo and Juliet, where I forget is it the Capulets and the you know what I'm not I don't I don't remember, but there are these two families, you know the the member of one family falls in love with the member of another family, but their families are trying to like are they outright trying to kill each other I, I don't remember. It's been a while. It's been a while since, you know, I just remember that Leo had a gun in it. No, the, the, there's something about that, you know, there, there's a conflict between the two families. And there it is obviously important that one of them's a Capulet and the other's whatever the other one is. You know, it, it wouldn't be the same if one of them was a Capulet and the other was some completely other family. But her being a senator has nothing... To, like, there isn't a conflict between senators and Jedi. You know, it, it's just, like, Lucas thought, oh, I'll make it like this, and then didn't think about, wait, but the reason it's in... You know, th there's, a, there's a specific reason. Like, Shakespeare was criticizing the... the he, he was pointing out the the kind of you know like like okay maybe the the maybe the head of one family and the head of another family absolutely hate each other but maybe they should think about what about your offspring what if they fall in love with each other you know it's he's he's pointing out how destructive these kinds of conflicts are meanwhile lucas like the jedi and the senator and the yeah and senators are not in conflict. On the contrary, like they literally, the one of the first things that happens in this movie is that, you know, Chancellor Palpatine says, Senator Amidala is in danger, so let's send some Jedi to protect her. That is literally the opposite of a conflict between them. So it just, it should just have been you know, you're you're a Jedi. That means we can't, you know. And let's see. According to IMDb trivia, you know, be before this movie came out, nobody knew exactly what the Clone Wars. I, I don't know, maybe there's expanded universe, but if you just watch the original trilogy, you don't know what are the details, what are the Clone Wars. We just know, you know, Obi-Wan fought in them, and that's why Leia's father trusts him, because the two of them fought together in the Clone Wars, you know. So, yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, George Lucas' original idea for the Clone Wars was for everybody in the galaxy fighting their own clones. I kind of do want to see that movie. That is that that does sound like, you know. Oh, okay. I I guess I don't know. Like the island only. It's Star Wars. I would watch that movie as long as it's not actually Michael Bay directing it. And one yeah, a critic points out that in this movie, many of the scenes, maybe most of them, develop either the character or the plot but not both, and that means that the movie wastes a lot of time. Ideally, you want most scenes to develop both. And it is, again, like, George Lucas sat down and wrote, and he had 
like there were there were certain things that he wanted to, to get across. There were there were, there are places he wants the characters to go. There are things he wants to happen in the plot, and he didn't he didn't find a good way to to make this like that's this is the kind of thing again hypothetically if he was submitting drafts to to an editor hoping to make this into a book you know the editor would send it back and say your your scenes are either you know yeah they're developing either or you really got to find a way to make it organic that they develop both so the handling of plot twists it's okay I don't think there are too many some of them are bad I don't think there are too few I, th I think maybe one or two are a bit too easy to figure out for the viewer it is not one of those movies that will that you know falls apart once you learn the twist but yeah some of the twists are definitely bad and yeah I'll, I'll talk about some of them in the in the spoiler section in the thoughts sections so once again it's directed by George Lucas and once again I've watched you know the other movies he's directed that I've watched are THX 1138 American Graffiti and yeah I've, I've watched all the Star Wars movies that he's written and the and and or direct yeah there we go and it I mean I already did somewhat say there's too much focus on the effects there's too much focus on the worlds are fantastic without a doubt the the aliens the robots the languages the technology all of this stuff it's it's incredible but it's clear that by the time that Lucas was making these movies that was what he was focused on like he had he had ideas for plot and characters he had places he wanted them to go he had ideas he wanted to explore but he wasn't I mean to some extent he when you look back at at he I'm not sure he was ever that good at psychology when when writing and directing like he he has things that he wants the characters to do but he doesn't always know why are the characters doing what they're doing and like does it completely make sense for them to yeah and the first shot is as usual space and then we get a pan and yeah and and the movie opens by making clear the kind of danger that Padme is in and the the yeah the opening does a pretty good job of setting up the core concept and getting the audience interested especially on that second thing it does much better than the Phantom Menace and closer to the original trilogy you can really tell that you know like he 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 read people criticizing the Phantom Menace which definitely deserves for the opening just being this kind of vague diffuse situation with like so many concepts thrown at us that I mean I I was no longer a child when I watched the prequel trilogy so I can only guess but I can't imagine kids had an easy time following all of this like this this political stuff of the from the start of Phantom Menace which yeah I already talked about that in the Phantom Menace video and the opening crawl does still have some issues but it is better than Phantom Menace's I'm not gonna give away whether the ending is happy or sad but it does fit with what came before the ending is okay it doesn't resort to Deus Ex Machina it doesn't like you know other convenient writing like ev everything is properly set up the parts that focus on the romance between Padme and Anakin are not 
that well handled since Lucas isn't good at the aspect of his character's emotions. He's good at affecting the audience's emotions. Like, if we're talking about two people falling in love. I would definitely say, like, The Amazing Spider-Man has much better chemistry, writing, and performances. I forget, did they actually, did those actors actually fall in love? I feel like I, I heard somewhere that they did actually fall in love while making those movies. And, yeah, it, it really comes across. And there you also have young people who, you know, there is a conflict, there is a reason why the at least one of them feels like they can't completely be together, they can't be themselves around each other, and, you know, so it is, there are some definite similarities, and, and that also has, you know, these comic booky aspects that also, yeah. Now, that brings us to the characters, and There are some characters where you're just not going to get very much information, which, you know, if that means you can't get into a movie, that, yeah, that means it's going to be harder for you to get into this movie. And some of the characters have aspects about them that make them harder to like. And, right, so... Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi continues to, like, he's he's trying, and he does do a pretty decent job making the character more than just boring and, and nothing, and he's given a lot more to work with here. In the first, in The Phantom Menace, he is basically, you know, he's, he's second banana to Qui-Gon Jinn, which, like, I think there are great things about Qui-Gon, uh, the character of Qui-Gon Jinn. But then Lucas goes and kills him off at the end of the movie, and it's like, you know, he's, he's basically the closest that movie has to a protagonist, to, to a character that is the, the lead, who drives the plot, and who really, you know, who we're most invested in and such, and then he dies, and, you know, it's, yeah, basically Obi-Wan should have had, should, should have, had Qui-Gon's role in the first one, then, you know, not died, obviously, since it's in the original trilogy, but, yeah, you know, now that he's not just the second most important Jedi, you know, yeah, he, he and Anakin are both leads in this, and, yeah, you know, Ewan McGregor clearly enjoys, like, sinking his teeth into this noir material, like when when yeah there's there's some questions he asks where you know just he's like character and actor alike are like oh this is good stuff this is this is the juicy stuff keep going keep going tell me more tell me more i'm i'm you know i'm i'm uncovering this and just like i he's he's watched some some bogey movies i'm almost certain and and like he gets that, you know, these detective characters, they love when when they really find some, like, a really compelling mystery, and they're figuring out what's what's going on, and, and so, yeah. And... Natalie Portman as Senator Padme Amidala. And, yeah, she continues to be depicted as really smart and mature, and... You know, there, there are debates where she holds her own, you know, way too many movies will imply that women can't argue, that, that they're, they'll are they just get emotional and try to manipulate the other side into letting them win. But here, you know, Lucas does understand, no, women can be just as logical and, and intelligent as, as men, you know, there, that's not something that only men can, can do. And his Star Wars movies are significantly better for that knowledge. And, yeah, Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker, I already mentioned, he does, it does sometimes really work. Like, when he and Padme, when, when the characters are 
smiling and laughing about something, that usually does work. And, like, you do buy that he is this, you know, he's, he's struggling with his emotions. And, yeah, the, there's some... There's some really great material, uh, yeah, bits where where he is incredibly convincing. Now, let's see. in the ten years since the Phantom Menace, he has grown powerful but arrogant. A large search for an actor to portray Anakin Skywalker was was performed. Lucas auditioned various actors, mostly unknown, before casting Christensen. Among the many established actors who auditioned were Jonathan Brandis, Devon Sawa. I I could kind of see that, yeah, Devon Sawa. From for um, among other things, he is in the first Final Destination movie, where he also uh, you know has has some he has some knowledge in that movie that you know, makes makes other people uncomfortable, and he struggles with, uh, yeah. Joshua Jackson, I gotta say, I have not seen him in enough stuff to say. Ryan Felipe, he could have done it as well. I, th I think, I mean, ultimately, he probably would have succumbed to Lucas's direction as well. Colin Hanks, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Based on, like, his 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 run in in Dexter, I yeah, incredibly talented. Paul Walker, R.I.P. I believe he's the he's the Fast and Furious guy that isn't Vin Diesel. I don't think I've. I feel like was was he in was he in Joyride? I think he was. I'm, I'm not actually asking. I'm, I'm thinking out loud. I think he was in Joyride. I, I remember him being fine in that. Leonardo DiCaprio also met with Lucas for the role, but was definitely unavailable, according to Gabriel publicist Ken Sunshine. And, yeah. You know, DiCaprio... I think, yeah, this was back when he was still, like, defined by Titanic, which, like, I mean, yeah, he's, he's, you know, in, in that movie, the way that he is, a, a lot of young women really fell for him, and a lot of men could not handle that at all. D DiCaprio, like, if you look at his early career, like, he did a bunch of independent movies, you know, he wasn't some no-talent who just, you know, looks pretty and, and, like, I get being frustrated with an actor being popular for being attractive and then, like, getting roles that they're not talented enough for. That sucks. But I've literally never seen DiCaprio give a bad performance. Now... Yeah, co-star Natalie Portman later told Time Magazine that Christensen gave a great reading. He could simultaneously be scary and really young. And, oh, right. According to IMDb Trivia, let's see, Christian Bale. Yeah, I mean, at that time, I mean, wouldn't he be a little old for the role? Or am I thinking of... I don't know, I, f I feel like there's a at least a little bit of an age difference between Bale and, and Natalie Portman, and Natalie Portman was cast for Phantom Menace, so they had to find someone who could, you know, work, yeah, with her as a, and Heath Ledger, yeah, I mean, he was doing, like, romantic comedy stuff at the time, wasn't that, I, I want to say, 10 Things I Hate About You, was that, like, 1999, so that would have been a right around that same time. I don't know. I I could I could see that. James Vanderbeek, yeah. Let's see. And Chris Klein. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, Hayden Christensen got the part primarily because he and Natalie Portman looked good together. 
And yeah, according to MDB Trivia, Hayden Christensen claimed to have greatly enjoyed filming the bar scene because it was all a real set and not just a green screen. I can totally see that. And it also shows in his performance. Like, you can tell this is something for him to really, like, there's stuff for him to work off of. You know, he can be reacting to things that are actually there. Over 400 young actors were screen tested for the part of Anakin Skywalker. And apparently an S Club 7 band member was considered for the role of Anakin Skywalker. The name Leonardo DiCaprio was also briefly mentioned, but it created such a negative fan response on the internet that he was never a serious contender. I mean, yeah. Because at the time, everyone thought of him as, oh, he's the Titanic. Yeah. The movie does not sell us that Anakin and Obi-Wan are close friends. There's like one scene really early on that does, but that's just too little to... Not late. Okay. It's... it's... Actually, yeah, it's neither too early nor too late, but it's, it's definitely too little. You know, that is, that is, like, we gotta remember, before the prequel trilogy, when you go back to the original trilogy, one of the things that, you know, Obi-Wan does specifically say about Anakin Skywalker is that they were friends. You know, and, and, I mean, they barely knew each other in Phantom Menace, and now it's been ten years, and, yeah, you know, you have this early scene, but other than that, just scene after scene, and in fact, that early scene wasn't originally in the script. It wasn't in the shooting script. Like, when they were filming the movie, it was, yeah, it was a reshoot. The, the, I, I think it was Lucas himself who was like, holy crap, they, these are not, friends. These two characters are not friends, and I, I he wrote that, I, I don't know if he wrote that line specifically, I'm not sure he was the only writer on, I want to say it was A New Hope, where Obi-Wan said he and Anakin Skywalker were friends, but yeah, you know, that was the movie you directed, dude. Just, you know, you, you gotta, I'm almost certain it's in A New Hope. Anyway, yeah, you know, suddenly, Lucas realized it actually doesn't like the the ah what's the word yeah the the movie doesn't convey that these are friends and because of that he he wrote this one scene and the, you know in the next movie there's a bunch of scenes that sell them as being close friends but yeah I'm not sure I want to talk about... Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Ian McDermott as Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. And he continues to give a really good performance. It just... It works when he gives these, you know... He's, he's delivering lines about politics and democracy and, and this stuff. Just, he, he can sell that kind of stuff. You know, a lot of people just don't have the, the, the confidence and charisma to completely sell that. Like, you understand why people would vote for this guy. You understand why people would trust him. And... I think I'm going to leave that character out of the review part, yeah. Now, when I did my video on The Phantom Menace, one of the things I criticized about it was that it didn't have a character like Han Solo, someone who brazenly breaks the rules and just does the thing that he either wants to do or feels he has to, regardless of what other people think. In this movie, we do have at least one character like that. I think, you know... Could have given more screen try, screen, 
screen time to, but at least they're there. Now, let's see. And Anthony Annals as C-3PO and and yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, instead of creating a new C-3PO suit for the film, the designers repainted and aged the one used in the original trilogy. Some of his most obnoxious comic relief stuff is in this. A lot of it also having head scratch inducing logic faults. I will grant ultimately not a huge amount of screen time is devoted to it, but it is so terrible it feels like it's much more. like. The first time I watched this movie, if you had asked me right after, I would probably have guessed that four or five times as much screen time was devoted to the slapstick that, or the, yeah, the comic relief. And, it, I, I mean, I tend to like his comic relief, you know, basically, like, you have this thing of him, like, he's, he's neurotic, he doesn't completely understand human behavior, but he's very helpful and he's always trying to be of help and such and like a lot of the times that is funny you know he's like Han Solo will be trying to carry out this ridiculously dangerous move with with the Millennium Falcon and C-3PO with panic in his voice will be like but the odds of surviving that is you know, one in three million seven hundred and twenty-five thousand, you know, something like that. And it's just, you know, and Han Solo's never tell me the, you know, oh, with the finger, of course, because it's Harrison Ford. And it's just, that's legitimately funny, you know, like it, because because you as the audience member, you're like, C-3PO, this is not what what is needed right now, okay? Just, you know. <laughs> And but at the same time we can understand like we ourselves might in that situation be like I, do you realize how dangerous what you're doing is you know but you know that kind of thing works but in this movie yeah just and ultimately I get it you know Lucas felt like well there has to be some like ah, what's the word there had to be some comic relief for the parts of the movie that. C-3PO does comic relief for, and I mean, at the end of the day, that is a pretty big part of Star Wars, it has always been, you know, like, there was a while where I was, I was having a bit of a snob phase, and I was like, uh, the prequel trilogy comic relief, you know, I, I was talking about how bad it is, and I at least... There was a while where I was like, there's no comic relief, or at least no bad comic relief in the original trilogy. Okay, maybe the Ewoks, but other than that. And then, you know, I got to rewatch the movie again. I was like, oh, wow, there's there's definitely comic relief here. And some of it is pretty bad, you know. But with that, it's still, yeah, it's still bad in this. And Kenny Baker as R2-D2, Anakin's astromech droid who often accompanies him and Obi-Wan on missions. And I suppose I will leave the... Yeah, I... Right. I will briefly note that... Ahmed Best returns as the now delegate Jar Jar Binks and right R.I.P. Kenny Baker did die. I was looking that up. Yeah. He was incredibly talented. You know, thankfully he did get to appear in a, a number of movies. Right. Ahmed Best as Delegate Jar Jar Binks. And, yeah, you know, she, he, he works for Padme. 
You know, maybe, maybe it's because she was like the one character in the first movie who seemed to not hate his guts and yeah. And in response to criticism, George gave him a much smaller role in this one. It's like it's 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 one of the biggest changes that George Lucas has made to a Star Wars thing in response to, to reception. And Yeah, Jar Jar's attempts at comic relief seen in The Phantom Menace were toned down. Instead, C-3PO reprised some of his bumbling traditions in that role. And... I think that is what I'm going to say about the... And... Terrence Stamp declined to reprise his role as Chancellor Lorum, saying that actors prefer to work with actors. And you might already know this, but Matt Doran, who, yeah, I'm, I gotta say his, his character name, who plays Elan Slizbagano. That that's not said in the movie, but he 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 sells death sticks, and yeah, that same actor played Mouse in the Matrix. So, you know, if if you feel like you've seen that guy somewhere before, that's yeah. Obviously, we know that Anakin Skywalker ends up becoming Darth Vader since we watched these in the order they were chronologically released. Since that's the way that makes sense to watch them. So it's not surprising when things show up in this movie that suggest he's headed down that path. But clearly George Lucas pushed him too far down that path in this movie, not having enough camaraderie between Anakin and Obi-Wan in this movie. And so in Revenge of the Sith, there is more camaraderie, and there are indications that Anakin is further away from the dark side than, in, than he is in this movie. So, yeah. And... That is, yeah, so that's it for the characters. Some of the characters are shown in tremendously varied circumstances, so we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. You know, there, there are instances in this movie where a character will pay Anakin a compliment, and it'll set him off on like a an, an a rant an angry or uh, like upset rant and you know that does convey you know yeah that's that's it's not a particularly healthy way to respond to to a compliment you know and I've I've read I'll I'll go into that in my Revenge of the Sith video, but you know he has there are some who have watched the movies and given him a a diagnosis based on it, and that does make a lot of sense. Anyway, cinematography the cinematography the the DP was David Tattersall, and the other things I've seen him DP are Speed Racer, next. Revenge of the Sith, Vertical Limit, The Green Mile, Phantom Menace, Soldier, and Con Air. So he is tremendously talented, and he does also give, he, he does do some really great work in this. A lot of the time, it is easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. The movie doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. And... Right, according to Wikipedia, war journalism, combat films, and footage of World War II combat influenced the documentary style camera work of a battle scene, even to the point that handheld shakes were digitally added to computer-generated scenes. 
since Lucas did something similar in the original trilogy, I can completely understand why he did why he did it here as well. I don't think it worked here. It just felt awkward and added to these scenes being overpowering. Like it's something that's really a, that's a that's a challenge for people who work on special effects. You know, if if you if ne if you've never worked on a visual effect and you watch a movie and some of the visual effects are overpowering, like you might be under you might be confused. You might be like, why did they make it like that? They they can't possibly themselves enjoy looking at effects that are that like overpowering. But the thing is, from the from the start of the process to the end, they have to look at some of these same effects. You know, at, at just a baffling amount of times because they're always making little adjustments and and so by the time they've worked on an explosion for example so many times yeah you know they they might get a little bored with it and so they might make it a little bigger or a little more confusing or a little more visually stimulating because to them it's always looked this way and they they have a harder time I'm not saying for all but some people who work in visual effects end up with the this problem and yeah I, I would definitely say it's something that's a problem for the prequel trilogy you end up with these scenes that when you see them for the first time they're just it's it's too much like it just washes over you and you know you're not sitting there like in awe of it it's just it's it's excessive and you know I, th I think after the prequels a lot of visual effects people have gotten a lot better at it I think a lot of big blockbuster movies today aren't as bad with with that kind of thing now so quoting fellow critics here gorgeous color palette lustrous polished visuals rich in color and creativity Lucas seems to have become much more creative as a director his visuals in this film are beautiful as always but it's his camera work that is noticeably different in this film as Steven Spielberg noted Lucas does his be best directing in this one and Yeah, I let's see. There's um Yeah, so there's a there's a lightsaber battle. The two characters appear to be blending into one another. Their faces illuminated by only only by their lightsaber blades. Yeah, the, the color flashing across each of their faces and yeah, I kept it vague enough that you don't know exactly what scene that is or who's in it. Despite more the occasional energetic effort behind the camera, Attack of the Clones is mostly lifeless, pedestrian, and boring. And the editing was handled by Ben Burt, who also edited episodes one and three, and George Lucas, who did editing on Let's see, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the original trilogy, American Graffiti, and THX 1138. And the, yeah, the editing also helps keep it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes and keep more calm when that is called for. I mean, there there are not very many scenes that should have been cut. Let's see. And the actually, I want to briefly talk about like the the action. There are times where the where you really can't completely tell what's going on in the who who's winning, who's losing, and 
that kind of thing, but a lot of the time the action in this yeah, you can you can follow it. You you the 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 action scenes in this movie don't end up like blending together, which is something like ideally you don't want action scenes to just blend together in in an action movie. No matter how many of them you have, you want each of them to be just distinct enough that people can remember and you know comparatively like I would say you know Shang-Chi has incredibly varied action scenes like I could it's you know I've only watched Shang-Chi once I watched it when it premiered here I mean I guess by now what has, I guess it's been a couple of months if I wanted to I could probably sit down and talk about every single action scene in that movie because they all stand out and I would say most of the time that is also yeah o overall that is true here you all of the action scenes stand out from each other and most of the time you can follow what's going on it's just it's a it's a bit too big and too fast overall but you can follow what's going on And yeah, the the battles have great editing and cinematography. Let's see. Some of the action sequences are brilliantly edited. And Quoting Philip Critics here, as an aside, I really noticed a lot of dull filler scenes. Is it really necessary to show everyone getting to and off transport ships? I, for one, am willing to make a leap of faith here and take for granted that characters in this universe can get from point A to point B. If you see them in the next scene on a different planet, I guess they made it, right? Picture this. The ship pulls up, picks up the passengers, and takes off. It then lands and the passengers get off. Sound exciting to you? If the movie was cut back about 10-15 minutes, I think it would have helped pick up the overall pace and flow of things. And others have pointed out that there are uh, a number of the scenes. I already mentioned that you have you have Obi-Wan going off to investigate this mystery and you have Anakin protecting Padme, a lot of the time Anakin and Padme together, there isn't really much of a sense of danger. They're, they're basically, like, fairly early on, they go to a place that's isolated, so it's it seems unlikely that anyone will find them there. And, yeah, for the next while, you know, for, for a while, when we see the two of them, it's it's romance and and dialogue and such it's not danger so the movie basically cuts between obi-wan progressing the plot which we want and then scenes of anakin and padme which we do not want you know the the yeah it it gets it gets frustrating and the way that like it kind of feels like the movie the movie kind of needs you know George Lucas needs for for Anakin and Padme to fall in love so we have scenes of that but he also needs the plot to progress and yeah so that happens when Obi-Wan has scenes and Yeah, the the intercutting like if you I think the the movie at the end of the day it does need both of those. Like the the movie doesn't accomplish everything it wants to if it doesn't have both of those things. But it it does feel like you know, some of the scenes move faster and cut sooner because the the 
you know, we need to get everything in, in there. And it's just, I think Empire Strikes Back did a much better job of balancing because that movie does also, you know, it every so often it'll cut between Luke and his training by Yoda where there is not a huge amount of danger and the scenes of Han and Leia fleeing the Empire, hiding from the Empire, where there is a sense of, of danger. And, you know, the, the, that's, that's basically where the plot happens, you know. Yeah, I've, if, if I recall, I specifically said that in my video on Empire Strikes Back, that there's never, you know, I've watched the movie, I've watched that movie a lot of times, dozens of times, and I've never felt that a scene cuts too, too quickly from, or, yeah, that the movie cuts too, too quickly or suddenly or frequently f between these two settings and sets of characters. You know, that movie does an incredible job at getting us to care about, you know, yeah, both sets of characters and not feeling like it's awkward and and it doesn't work when it when it cuts between them and yeah for this movie it's yeah this movie has a problem with that the special effects are great the you know ultimately they don't hold up and they weren't completely convincing when the movie came out and the movie relies too heavily on it. And it also, like, it really, really shows that, you know, this movie is much worse than The Phantom Menace in its over-reliance on green screen and CG that even the time many, many realized, many of us realized, was not going to keep being considered impressive and holding up scrutiny. Like today, 2021, by now, we can do CG that is completely seamless if done right. If I recall, I heard that not a single set was built for this movie. Everything is green screen so they could tweak it in the animation studios. And while you may not always be able to tell that what you're looking at isn't real, you do get a sense that there's something off. The actors have nothing to act off of because so many of the settings are handled by this green screen room with a treadmill for the actors to walk on everyone is always walking from one part of the setting to another and once you've seen 10 different scenes of people walking from one place to another you get really fed up with watching people walking and this is not an issue that you have with movies that are not this heavily CG but once you start doing CG it's hard to stop because it's so much fun you want to see how far you can go and obviously it's more exciting to animate a room that people are walking through than one where people are just standing in one place. The sets are animated, the props are animated, vehicles are animated, obviously a lot of the alien characters are animated. I mean, at that point, why not just animate entire human characters too? They realized this, and so they did. And it feeling fake is a huge problem. And the special effects of this, and especially the next, are entirely too busy. Like. Based on clips I've seen from Transformers movies, those are much, much worse. But that is really to be expected. Like, it's it's going to get increasingly busy the longer, you know, by the time they started making Transformers movies, it was extremely easy to... I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, like, it's still hard. I do acknowledge it is extremely hard work. But I'm saying that the the... Comparatively, it is a lot easier to make a creature or a robot or something that is busy in design, that moves a lot, you know, today with, with CG, than it was in like 1977 to do it with puppetry, animatronics, stop motion or something, you know, and because of that, yeah, today they get really 
busy. At this point, nothing or infinitely, insignificantly little remains quote-unquote real in these movies. That in, in, in itself doesn't have to be a problem, but we can tell it doesn't feel right. Sin City doesn't have this problem, nor does 300. The effects are, technically speaking, amazing, but nothing else in this really goes beyond decent. And according to Wikipedia, the film relied almost solely on digital animatics as opposed to storyboards in order to pre-visualize sequences for editing early on in the film's production. While Lucas had used other ways of producing motion-based storyboards in the past, after The Phantom Menace, the decision was made to take advantage of the growing digital technology. The process began with Ben Burtt's creation of what the department dubbed as videomatics, so-called because they were shot in a household video camera. In these videomatics, production assistants and relatives of the department of workers acted out scenes in front of green screen using computer-generated imagery, CGI. Pre-visualization department later filled in the green screen with rough background footage, but then cut together this footage, sent off to Lucas for changes and approval. The result was a rough example of what the final product was intended to be. Pre-visualization department then created a finer ver yeah, version of the videomatic, by creating an animatic in which the videomatic actors, props, and sets were replaced by digital counterparts, giving a precise but still rough look at what would eventually be seen. The animatic was later brought on set and shown to the actors so that they could understand the concept of the scene they were filming in the midst of the large amount of blue screen used. And that does, you know, that does help some. You can tell that they had some idea of what it was going to look like. And... The budget was estimated at 120 million, which makes yeah this was the most expensive Star Wars film until Force Awakens, with an estimated budget of 200 million. Now, once again, they use locations really well to make you know yeah. There's sites around. Italy, Spain, Australia, Tunisia, that, uh, yeah, you know, really, oh, actually, wait, Australia, now that, actually, that was a studio, never mind, but the other ones, you know, real places, and it's, yeah, it, it makes, you know, they, they found some places that are much more exotic looking than what the average American sees when he looks out his window. And because of that, we believe that these are, you know, well, what's the word? These are other planets and such. And let's see, the right, so that brings us to the action. Some of it is quick, tight, and dirty, some of it is grand, carefully choreographed. The scenes are memorable, distinct from one another, but still feel like they belong in the same movie. Most of them are filmed well, most of them are edited well. They almost live up to the standard for the franchise. They're, they're definitely the biggest that we'd seen by this point in the franchise. Which, you know, I've, I've seen sequels where they didn't really deliver something that was big enough that it felt like, you know, it was that it lived up to the standards of the franchise. 
in my video on Phantom Menace, I said that I do not feel the lightsaber action feels overly choreographed. I stand by that. But I definitely do think it's a problem in this and the next one. Basically, George Lucas and others working on this felt that the lightsaber should reflect that these are masters at their craft, and so they look to real-life masters of fencing. You know what happens when you spend an extremely long time mastering something in a safe environment where you aren't afraid of getting hurt while doing it? You start showing off and doing things you wouldn't do if you were in danger, and that's exactly what the lightsaber stuff feels like in this and Revenge of the Sith. And I recommend Jill Barrick's videos on the lightsaber stuff, and, you know, again, if everything in these... Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen a video of her that was bad. Now, let's see. And according to IMDb Trivia, like Ewan McGregor did in Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace, Hayden Christensen made lightsaber noises the first time he was handed one in rehearsal. After chuckling at the young star's antics, George Lucas informed him they probably had people in sound effects who could do a better job in post-production. And... Yeah, the lightsaber bits could be considerably, considerably better. They're particularly unimpressive compared to Phantom Menace. And at times, it's the tamest it's been since Return, although it isn't all bad. The action in general, mostly, it's just overdone and goes on for too long. And... It sucks because there's some great ideas, choreography, characterization, and variety going on. Some of the best of the six movies Lucas did. There's definitely more variation here than in the foreign films released before it. And, like, let's see. Thinking about Revenge of the Sith. I think maybe overall there's more var variation in this than in Revenge of the Sith overall. Now, the action scenes include chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, lightsaber action, shooting including shooting while in vehicles, use of the force. In the riff tracks for this movie, when the movie ends, I, I when, when the end credits start rolling, they say the movie doesn't so much end as subside. The action in this movie is exhausting. I don't think there's a single action scene that that isn't true of. Every single action scene goes on for too long, ending up getting tedious, too much action without any status changes, and that is something that, you know, in the early to mid 2000s, there, yeah, it, it happened to a number of movies in the early to mid 2000s because CGI because of digital editing and filming you know there yeah there are a lot of movies that that's true of it's yeah it's definitely a big problem for this movie and it's not as though you cannot do this kind of thing well after the early to mid 2000s filmmakers learned restraint you know, some of the action scenes in, you know, at least some of the MCU movies, maybe especially a movie like The First Avengers, also get, like, really huge and go on for a long time. But because there are enough status changes along the way, because there are human moments in there, it doesn't get to be excessive. I don't think there's just... No, yeah. Uh, there's... I've, I've watched all of the movies of the MCU, and I love the action of all of them. And... It really is just, like, in this movie, it just, too much of it is spectacle with not, yeah, with without human moments in there. And, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, okay, so this is, big spoiler for this movie. The, yeah, behind the scenes say that there's a hundred, maybe two hundred Jedi. And once they've been introduced, there's this big fight scene where you will see some Jedi fighting in the background of every single shot in, in this one action scene. And yeah, it's overkill. It's way too chaotic for it to be all that compelling. It's just like, 
it's like actually yeah no more spoilers for the time being it's kind of like if it feels like these action scenes were designed by someone who just doesn't have any like like the like they themselves can't tell when something is excessive like it's like if you let a child eat exactly as much candy as they wanted to you know like yeah they they go completely wild and then they just collapse because it's too much and that's kind of what happens with the action scenes in this you know it, it becomes too much and we the viewer just end up kind of okay let's Let's get it, let's get it over with, let's, you know. Now, that brings us to the music and score. And, you know, as per usual, handled by John Williams, who did, yeah, he, he scored all of the, main Star Wars movies, the, the, you know, episodes one through nine, and, yeah, in, in general, you know, lots of, and, and this does have some of the best score of, of the, of the six movies, and, I mean, that is, like, I would have to say, of all six movies, the one thing you can never say is bad is the score. The score is always, without exception, good. And, yeah, there's there's some really memorable, very effective parts of the score in this. And I don't have a lot to say about the sound design. It's, it's great, as usual. I suppose... Okay, technically this is yeah, a spoiler. There's this bit where someone is flying through um, an asteroid field and they're using something called seismic charges. And basically when these explode, there's like a second or so where there's just no sound. And they, like in the behind the scenes they talk about, it's supposed to be like an audio black hole, like so suddenly no sound exists near this this point and then there is this massive you know almost overpowering noise of the explosion and it's just it's the kind of incredibly clever creative idea that keeps these movies fresh you know and i think it was ben burt who, who came up with that no more spoilers and let's, i already did talk about the comic relief. Right. Tone. I'm really glad that Lucas... Like, I'm... I'm not sure this movie particularly has, like, childish or cute things in this. Like, episode 6 has Ewoks. Episode 1 has Jar Jar Binks. Like... The um, right, so yeah, the the pacing is reasonable. I do think that you know the the fact that. Like, sometimes Obi-Wan is in significant danger, and, yeah, then it'll cut. And, like, Anakin and Padme are not in danger. Yeah, that is a problem. Now, the Disney Plus version of the movie is 2 hours and 16 minutes long, without any credits, 2 hours, 22 and a half minutes long, with them, and... The yeah, I, I would say it would be good if it was trimmed down at least some. It definitely feels longer than it is, and 
yeah. So the best element, the the yeah. The action is sometimes used, sometimes very intimate and personal, and features scenarios that fans have dreamt of seeing. And yeah, I'll just briefly okay. So big spoilers: a well-trained Jedi fighting. Not Boba Fett, but his father, Jango Fett, and it being an ongoing battle, a dozen or two Jedi fighting a massive group of enemies that are all armed with blaster assault rifles, dual wielding lightsabers. No more spoilers. Now, if you if you don't think you'll love this movie, I wouldn't quite say that that's enough to make worth make it worth watching the movie now and the yeah the 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 worst aspect is when it tries to entertain you I'm not only referring to action scenes also scenes that are supposed to be atmospheric or cool suspenseful it's often exhausting and overpowering and I think that is a big problem for the movie. Worst, you know, according to others, I've seen a number of people say that it's too silly, and I get it. And, yeah, I, I would say, you know, there's definitely stuff that, yeah, there, there are things you can point to in this movie that are, yeah. And I was most worried that there would be more of the stuff that was wrong with the Phantom Menace and sometimes the movie lived down to my expectations other times it exceeded them meaning that I was pleasantly surprised at times that it wasn't as bad and the thing I was most looking forward to was the Star Wars quality and the movie exceeded my expectations and the trailers do give too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. And the covers, some of the covers and posters also give too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. So the, let's see. Yeah, when I, when I search on YouTube for videos about this, I found around 60 of them. On the tomato meter, this has 65% and a 56% audience score. And yeah, of the, of the 252 reviews for this, 164 of them are fresh, so... Yeah, I I feel like that's more than Phantom Menace. The you know, and I can understand thinking that this is better than Phantom Menace. I think I actually used to think that the prequels just got better the the further along. And on Metacritic, it has fifty four out of one hundred from critics, six point one out of ten from users. And on IMDb, it has a 6.5 out of 10. And let's see. The, yeah, so 26.4% gave it a 7. 16% gave it an 8. 19.5 gave it a 6. And those are the, yeah. I could I could definitely understand moving that. And right. I yeah, a couple of things. Simison said that you know, people shouldn't have high expectations for episode 2 since episode 1 was so bad. I've seen several people say that you know, 
that doesn't have to be the case since the you know the original trilogy were, were good so of the you know when phantom menace came out that was still two or three good star wars movies versus one or two bad ones but the you know the I think Jeremy of CinemaSins logic here is that George Lucas, you know, when, when Phantom Menace came out, we knew that George Lucas was going to be writing and directing episodes two and three. Why would he be able to make a better movie than Phantom Menace? You know, so so I, I do think it makes sense to go in, you know, once you watch Phantom Menace, to expect you know, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith to be, you know, closer to those than to, like, Episode Four, which was otherwise the last time he directed a Star Wars movie. You know, it, it makes sense to have high expectations for Episode One based on Episode Four, but after watching Episode One, you know, you, you couldn't claim that he's as good as he used to be and you know how much better could he become between episodes one and two the movie tries too hard to tie in with the original trilogy there are cool ideas and concepts but their lackluster execution results in them merely being unable to be used again soon by more talented filmmakers and let's see, um, Right, I copied in about the various awards that it won. Let's see. And right, according to IMDb trivia, the death sticks that the pusher tries to sell Obi-Wan were a hallucinogenic drug. The drug's name is an obvious reference to cigarettes, according to George Lucas. Much like with cigarettes, with each dose, the user's life was shortened. The successive dosages took away larger chunks from their lifespan, and the desire for more for a more intense reaction increased. Lucas inserted this personally into the film due to his strict views concerning smoking. And yeah, the following isn't a, a spoiler. There's a there's something in the movie named Geonosis. And that's taken from the Greek word used in ancient time, gnosis, meaning knowledge. Which, you know, you, you have that in some, uh, like, diagnosis, prognosis. I feel like there's others, but those are just off the top of my head. Now, I forgot to mention in my Phantom Menace review, but I'm making up for it here. Belated Media has made, I mean in general, his videos are great. Like completely unrelated, but he made like for, for uh, what was it called, Back to the Future Day, back in 2015, you know, when it actually was the day that, I guess that's kind of a spoiler, but yeah, it's a significant day in Back to the Future. You know, he, he released this video where he reviewed some movies which you might know something about if you know Back to the Future. There we go. That's sufficiently vague. But yeah, for Star Wars, he made What If Episode 1 Were Good, What If Episode 2 Were Good, and What If Episode 3 Were Good. And they are just, like... He, you know, he's not the only person who rewrites the prequels to make them good, but he is one of the best. It's, it's absolutely incredible stuff. And, like, you know, if you've, if you have watched all, th or, yeah, if you've watched at least one of the prequels, I recommend watching his video on that prequel. I recommend this to anyone who liked Phantom Menace, basically. Yeah, people who must watch all of Star Wars. Now, the DVD has a pretty decent amount of stuff, you know. 
theatrical trailers and TV spots, documentaries, deleted scenes, featurettes, and yeah, there's some there's some really good stuff. Like if you are if if you want to know more about it, the the DVD, like you know, obviously it's only going to be worth buying if you also want to have the movie. But if you want to have access to the movie and the the yeah, and you know, Wikipedia notes that the Attack of the Clones DVD also features a trailer for a mockumentary style short film known as. R2-D2 Beneath the Dome. Some stores offered the film mockumentary as an exclusive bonus disc for a small extra charge. The film gives an alternate look at the quote-unquote life of the droid R2-D2. The story, which Lucas wrote, was meant to be humorous. I feel like that's, what's the term, throwing shade? Meant to be, but not actually, I guess. Like, I haven't watched the entire mockumentary, but the trailer's a lot of fun. I, I thought I thought the you know, the people who appear in it give good performance. Like, it's it's difficult to pretend that R2-D2... Like, you have Hayden Christmas and Natalie Portman and Sam Jackson talking about R2-D2 as if he were a fellow cast member rather than a, a like, robot... I'll just call it suit, but, you know, the... the yeah that Kenny Baker went into. You know, there is an actor there, but it's not literally R2-D2. Anyway, it's it's difficult. It's difficult to deliver lines based on that premise, and they do quite a good job. And, you know, the... the yeah, if you have Disney+, Plus, it has about 11 minutes of deleted scenes, and, you know, they're... I, I wouldn't, like, if, you, if you're a huge fan of Star Wars, Disney Plus has, like, it has all of the movies and most of the shows, so, you know, for that, but there isn't, like, I've only watched the, the, the ones for the six Star Wars movies that George Lucas made. But for those, like, okay, okay, some of them, some of them, there is a lot of, of, there's a lot of special features for it, but some of them just have, you know, a dozen minutes of deleted scenes. So that by itself is not, you know, like, hypothetically, if you already have them on DVD, there's not necessarily a lot of incentive for you to get them on, for, yeah, for you to pay for Disney+. Plus, Which, you know, comparatively, I'd say a lot of, yeah, most MCU movies have good stuff, some have a lot. And, yeah, so, I rate this five excessively fanservice-y fan scenes out of ten. And, you know, it's it's one of those things, like, for the, for the, based purely on the technical aspect of the movie, I want to give it higher. But the the story and the acting and the dialogue and the romance and the action just drag it down. And it's yeah. But I'm gonna get more into that when I get into the thoughts sections, which speaking of thoughts. So, starting with the first thought section, disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers. Since a lot of it is very standard information, I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes do during this section, once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. And, once again, final warning. This contains spoilers for the the movie and episodes four, four through six and one. Not for episode three. So, this is the part where I get into, am I glad that this is a sequel and prequel? And why? 
I mean, I do think... I think some of the political commentary works really well here. I, I think the fact that if you watch this, you know, if you watch this movie, you really should have watched episode one first. And if you do, you, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if, I can imagine that you probably guessed watching the first movie that Palpatine and Sidious are the same person, but yeah, if, you know, if you watch this movie, cer certainly in this movie, you know, by the end of this movie, you'll know for sure. And then you can look at, oh, hey, he tricked some people into doing something that got them in trouble and started a war. And now he's, like, in charge. And he just kind of, like, he'll, he'll say, oh, you know... I love democracy. I don't want to take this extra power, but he sure took it. And now there's an army. Now there's a war. You know, this kind of... The movie couldn't have done that if... Like, let's hypothetically say that Lucas couldn't make a trilogy. Let's say he had to make just one movie. Well, it wouldn't work that well. It wouldn't have the same impact. And as a prequel, I do think it is interesting seeing a younger Anakin Skywalker than we got in the original trilogy, not than we got in Phantom Menace, obviously. And I do think that some of his, like, we get more more an idea of who he is here than we did in, you know, like, Phantom Menace. Like, he's basically just you know what what's the term like he's a he's a he's one of those characters who's like he's a a child prodigy you know he's a child prodigy he's got good values he thinks you know he like he knows that he's not worthless just because he's a slave you know it's it's not bad but it's not like incredible and in this one you get more, and I do think it is interesting, and I think, I guess I'm not going to go into the, the diagnosis thing here, but I, I do think there's a chance that some people might watch this movie in Revenge of the Sith, and they'll realize, wow, I actually know, one, know someone who's a lot like Anakin. I should get them psychiatric help, you know, and that's... I don't know if that was something George Lucas, like, thought about as part of what he was making, what he was doing when making these movies, but that is something that is accomplished, you know. I am... Right. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MSC theme paper, Riff Jackson, other jokes. And the time codes for the sections are in the description box. The section right of this is thus I while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? So those would definitely be Palpatine, Django, Boba, Dooku, Anakin, and the Sand People. And Let's see, and whether it does or not, do I think they made the right choice? See, I I don't think the movie really has empathy for the sand people, and I do think that is like it's it's kind of disturbing because like they clearly are intelligent, but you know, uh, I wanna say Klieg Lars is the you know, the is is Shmi's husband and he talks about like he says they people say they have the minds of humans, but they are like animals, they're monsters, some something like that. And Anakin also expresses hatred of them, and the movie doesn't treat his slaughtering of them as as bad as it should be as bad as it would be in real life. I mean, essentially, the real world equivalent would basically be like an indigenous tribe. You know, they're not, we're not talking like 
may, uh, monkeys or something. I couldn't make up my mind if I wanted to say monkeys or apes, so I said mapes. Monkeys don't have the, you know, they're, they're not equivalent to monkeys. They're equivalent to an indigenous tribe. They clearly, they're intelligent. They, they like, they build huts. They hunt. The, you know, they, they have tools. These are not animals. They are, you know, they're, they're, they're Come like that they they are seen as less they're, they're seen as inferior because they're not as technologically advanced and you know I guess culturally advanced probably you know but yeah the movie doesn't act like and and again it's George Lucas when making these movies did not know his own blind spots like hypothetically imagine imagine if you heard that someone you cared about killed indigenous people because he hates them because he thinks that all of them are awful like that's that's reprehensible and the movie kind of acts like it's just yeah it, it's and and at the end of the day I I don't think that George Lucas actively thinks that the the you know if you aren't in this at the same stage as you know, we in the West, that that means you're inferior, but he did choose to make it sand, you know, the, like we know these are, like he could, he could have made it that she got mauled by an animal and, and Anakin went out and killed that animal or maybe others like it or something, but no, Lucas chose to make it intelligent beings and specifies that Anakin killed everyone there including the women and the children and yeah let's see so for the others yeah I don't think the movie has empathy for Palpatine it, it understands how he does what he does I'm not sure I would say this one really gets into why I suppose Revenge of the Sith somewhat does let's see Django is basically just like he doesn't really have empathy for others other than Boba. Yeah, I, I mean, he's basically just supposed to be this kind of yeah, ruthless, you know, bounty hunter. And other than right before... Like, right at the end, I think the movie has empathy for Boba when he holds up his father's helmet. But other than that, no empathy for him. The movie does have some empathy for Anakin. Let's see, Dooku. I, I'm not sure it does particularly have empathy for him either. I think it's a problem that the movie doesn't have empathy for the same people. But other than that, I think they made the right choices in who to have empathy for and who to not. Palpatine, Django, and Dooku are just such fun villains, and I'm not sure we'd get a lot out of Boba being more humanized in this. Like, we're not really shown any glimpses of his humanity in the original trilogy, and yeah, like, it wouldn't have made his character better if we knew more. Like, I, you know, an argument could be made that it's not, you don't enjoy the original trilogy more by knowing that Anakin was whiny as a teenager, but I do think that there, there are things about, like, I, I would say probably the, the, if I, if I would point to one thing about the prequel trilogy that makes you appreciate the original trilogy more, it would be that in the original trilogy we see what life under fascism is like, and we see what fascist leaders do, and in the prequel trilogy we see what society was like before the fall of democracy, before these, ah, uh, what's the word, before fascism took hold. And I do think that that is a compelling, ah, what's the word? 
right? That, you know, when you see how huge of a contrast there is between life under democracy and life under fascism, and you see how fascism took hold, you know, that helps you, yeah, that, that makes it more compelling. But, you know, overall, like, if, if I was just advising, if I met someone who had never watched any of the movies, I'd probably just tell them, watch episodes four and five, make up your own ending to five, and pretend the other movies don't exist. But, anyway. So, let's see. The... Right, it's a, it's a movie that is aware that women can kick ass, like... We don't, there aren't a lot of female Jedi, I don't think, but we, you know, Padme gets to kick ass some, and I think the movie does a good job. Honestly, you know what, I think this might be the movie that does the best job of the first six Star Wars movies with a creepy creature that is scary to children without being like you know a horror movie that children can't handle that is a threat to at least one of the the heroes like the the designs and the actions of the three alien creatures on Geonosis in the arena those are probably the most compelling of these of the six George Lucas Star Wars movies that just I, I I think this might have been what Lucas like when when you know when they made Episode Six and they had the Rancor, I think they wanted something bigger and I you know that's what we got here and it's some of what works some of the best and it, like at the end of the day that none of those creatures do have a lot of screen time but the amount of screen time they have is is right. We never get bored with them or used to them. I like that Anakin and Padme both, like, at the end of the day, Padme does need help. And I, I mean, I don't love that it's an, yet another movie where a man is saving a woman when we need more movies where women show, like, where we, that depict that women can take care of themselves, but the, you know, they don't need no man, but I don't think, I mean, an argument could be made that it's because he's a Jedi and she's a civilian. She doesn't have any superpowers at all. And considering that, she does incredibly well uh, fighting the, the kitty rat, I want to say, was what everything great by named the the creature and yeah like you know she manages to to climb up and away from it it does manage to scratch her back but she she hits it with the chain and then ultimately anakin takes out the kitty rat by you know running into it with the the bull like creature and she jumps down onto the bull like creature so they ride together and, you know, I, I thought that worked, you know, giving Anakin a, a moment where he, you know, there, there are several times where he saves her. And, you know, he also saves her with the worms at the start of the movie. And, yeah, I, uh, I, th I thought that worked pretty well. That, and that also, that does help, like... I, I don't necessarily think that it's a healthy relationship, but some relationships do start by, you know, one of the people doing something that really changes the other person's life, maybe even saves their life. And, yeah, I... I it, it's, it's easier to believe that she would end up with him, you know based on him saving her life twice than the kinds of things he says and the way he says them. 
my making jokes in this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad or me wanting to make light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I watch. And that does bring us to the next section entitled Notes Taken While watching. I like that the queen does appear to be in the ship before the explosion and then after the explosion we realize that the person we saw must have been the decoy. We only saw the back of her head. Her voice did sound extremely similar to Padme but the which you know the once the decoy is dying, she doesn't sound that much like Padme, but I guess at that point there was no reason for her to put up that act. And voice imitation does make sense, something you'd want to be good at if you're going to double someone. You seem a little on edge. Reshoot jitters. Our presence will be invisible. We have mastered the art of standing so incredibly still that we are imperceptible to the eye. We did also have an invisibility machine, but... Said. The tension is thick when Anakin argues with Obi Wan in front of Padme and the others, and like when when you know Obi Wan says, you know, we will follow our orders, and you will follow my lead, young Padawan, and then Anakin says why, and for like a second you're like, did he seriously just say why should I follow your orders? But then he, you know, and and Obi Wan's like, excuse me. And then Anakin does, you know, and I, I I, do think it comes through in the performance. It's not that Anakin realized, oh, crap, I overstepped. I must, I got to think of something. No, he was saying, why should we not try to figure out who is, like, trying to kill her? The bugs know to hide from R2. I guess their bite isn't the only thing about them that smarts. I have a lot to say about the 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 bugs and the chase scene through the. the I I will get into them in the next section. M most of them. Some of them are in this section. I do appreciate that Obi Wan and Anakin flying through, chasing the assassin, flying through the city chasing the assassin shows how good of a pilot Anakin is. The bit in Episode One. Like, the pod race, sure. But the bit at the end was pretty hard to swallow. Okay, so he's never flown one of these craft before. Like, I'll grant that he's he has a little bit of knowledge about Naboo craft because he does learn a little from the pilot on the, on the thing they fly, and that's from Naboo. But he's never flown one of the starfighters from the end of the movie. And that, like, think of how easy it would have been. Just literally have it be that at the end, he's in a ship that he's been in. Like, maybe maybe they have more than one ship. One of them is mainly for fighting, so it goes along with the Queen's ship for protection. And Anakin is in that ship, and so he learns the controls. He learns how to fire, you know. But no, instead, like, oh, uh, let's see. Press this button, press this button. Okay, now I'm flying. I'm flying at the... Death Star looking thing. Okay, let's shoot a couple of times. Oh, it's blowing up. And I'm flying away. Good. You know, that's just like, seriously, it's just, it's completely ridiculous. This is easier to believe, even though it is still kind of ridiculous. But considering how good of a pilot he is in A New Hope, and, you know, he's dis like Anakin Skywalker is described as being an incredible pilot by Obi Wan in the original trilogy. Of course, we want to see it now that CG allows for a much faster flight in compared to in movies compared to the original trilogy. That was some shortcut, Anakin. It's supposed to be a challenge. If it was easy, it would just be called The Way. When Anakin is on foot chasing down the assassin, maybe it's the fact that they actually are running past extras, maybe it's the fact that there is a set, maybe it's both, but that is a scene that feels more real and exciting than a lot of the action in this. Like, it, I mean, it's essentially like a an on-foot police chase like you could get it from a 1970s TV show but yeah it feels like you you you're like 
come on, catch up to him. You know, like, you really get into it. And, like, a lot of the flying around, it's just, it's it's so fake. It's, it's, we can't really get into it. You know, which com comparatively, I still get into the action in the original trilogy, especially in episodes four and five, and those I have also watched the dozens of times. So it's not that I've just, oh, you know, I've grown bitter about this movie because I've watched it so many times. I've watched the original trilogy a lot of times too. I'm, I'm, I can still sit down and watch episodes four and five and just absolutely love it. You know, if Django had shot. I want to say her name is Zam, the assassin, with the sniper that she used to blow up that flying thing that carried the worms. Obi-Wan probably wouldn't have had any lead to go on at all, but no, he had to use the toxic dart that might as well have had his fingerprint and social security number on it with how rare it is, how easy it is to track him by it. Remember, if the prophecy is true, he is the only one who can bring balance to the Force. Now, since all three of us presently know what bringing balance to the Force is, there is definitely no reason for us to spend a few words explaining it just in case, I don't know, an audience is watching us. Because honestly, who cares if they understand what this prophecy that we keep mentioning and is extremely important to the plot of these three movies means. I'll, I'll get to the bottom of this plot quickly, my lady. Honestly, a lot of your audience will be pretty disappointed in how easily it is for me to figure out what's going on. The movie finds it necessary to over-explain why the archives don't show the planet Camino, but then it doesn't really explain who was Sifo Diaz, why did he commission a clone army, and yes, I've heard that these are explained outside of these three movies, but I do think that they are significantly more important mysteries than the planet having been erased from the archives. I mean, you literally could have just had, like, go from, like, okay, we see Obi-Wan at Dexter Jetsters getting the information. Okay, go to Kamino. Okay, next time we see Obi-Wan, you know, cut to Anakin doing something stupid. Next time we see Anakin, he's, you know, he arrives and he says, there it is, R4. And then he says, it's right where I heard it would be, but it wasn't in the Jedi Archives, so someone must have erased it. That's all. You know, you don't need these couple of scenes where he looks it up in the Archives, he goes to talk to Yoda and the younglings. They really don't add anything other than screen time. And, oh, okay, fair enough. If I was a child when I first saw this, and I saw a bunch of kids standing there with lightsabers, I would have thought that was cool. But you could have come up with, a, like, just have the scene be about something else. Master Sifo-Dyas was killed almost ten years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. What I am not is suspicious. I see no reason to be suspicious about this at all. Honestly, this scene might as well have proceeded without you even saying out loud that he was killed since... While it might be good for the audience to know, the fact that I know does nothing to change how I behave. When Anakin and Padme kiss by the lake in Naboo, it feels out of the blue for her. She really hasn't expressed romantic love for him in this movie by this point. A little admiration, sure, sympathy, definitely, but not romantic love. And, you know, I'll, I'll grant that she, I, I think she does feel some love for him in Phantom Menace, but it's not romantic love. Like, she's, she's like, I'll take care of you. You'll be okay. Don't worry. Uh, you know, the, like, you know, he's being taken away from his mother and he's like, there's a lot of stuff going on right around him in, in the Phantom Menace. So you understand that he's, you know, kind of scared and stuff, but, you know, she, she tries to take care of him. It doesn't, you don't get the sense that they're going to, you know, procreate. You know, Boba Fett opens the door and lets in Ton Wee, I think he calls her, and Obi-Wan, he's looking at like, looking at Obi-Wan like, I don't trust no one but my dad, the characters who consist entirely of CGI. I don't know why I made him Southern. 
I was rooted by a man, man called Tyrannus. Something which, by the end of the movie, appears to be a statement of fact. Because, why would I lie to you? Seriously, though, I think the reason he does tell the truth here, there, is that he knows that Tanwi, the alien standing next to them, knows the truth, and that she might point out if he lied about that. And since by the end of the movie we know that Count Dooku is Tyrannus, you know, we, we have at least that tiny little bit of certainty regarding the mystery in this movie. Because that really is, like... <laughs> It's kind of funny how the Kamino and Cloners, they seem kind of, I don't want to necessarily say indifferent, I guess oblivious to the fact that there's clearly something going on. Like, you know, he shows up and he's like, uh, the guy who talked to you, he's dead. He's been dead for 10 years. And and, and also, I, I want to say, was it belated media maybe who pointed out that, you know, okay, 10 years, they haven't said like, a Star Wars equivalent of an email about that like that seems like a long time for for something like that to be going on and then not hearing anything like it's just it's it's pretty wild and then like yeah you know like Ton Wee is standing there and Obi-Wan and and Jango Fett are like sizing each other like if if like, the, the way they talk to each other, the way they look at each other, they're clearly trying to figure out how much does he know, and is this, like, Jango Fett is trying to figure out, do I have to kill this guy? Is that going to be necessary for, for my boss to be successful in what he wants to... Uh, Let's let's get him to say a few more things before... And, and Obi-Wan is like, so this is probably the guy... How much does he know, and what exactly has he done? And just and Tom's Tom, we stand there, her her head, you know, way above their heads, just looking directions. She she cannot somehow it goes over her head, not theirs. It, it's it's just kind of hilarious to me that that she's standing there. Like I don't know why they didn't just have her have it be that like. You know, Ton Wee goes in there, and then once Django shows up, she could just say, I'll let you have some privacy and leave. But I'm I'm almost 100% certain that she's still standing there when they're having their conversation. Multiply our adversaries. Well, so you're standing right now, they're being abstinent. I do quite like the hand-to-hand -hand fight between Obi and Jango. Uh, really, the entire fight. Not not the bit with the spaceships, but when they're just on the platform and such, between Obi-Wan and Jango. The choreography, the tension, it's visceral, it feels real, especially when they're, like, kicking and punching each other and, and this kind of stuff. You just, yeah. And there's, yeah, there's some really good, like, okay, so at first, Obi-Wan has a lightsaber and Jango has the, the blaster pistol, so he's firing, Obi's deflecting, so he flies up, and he, you know, he's crawling on that thing, and, you know, turns out the thing on his back, in a, like, yeah, there's a jetpack, but there's also a rocket, and it is, like, if you watch, I can imagine, like, people looked, people watched episodes 5 and 6, and they were like, is that a rocket on Boba Fett's back? Wow, you know, just that, that kind of thing, and, you know, the, the, the thing that, let's see, it's that, yeah, the, I, 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 I gotta admit, I don't remember everything about the choreography, but, you know, Obi-Wan loses his lightsaber, Django loses his pistol, so Django, you know, gets this, 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 like, ah, uh, what's it called, like, like, bit of, bit of wire, or, or something, you know, around Obi's hands and then like Obi-Wan knocks Django over the edge and he's like oh not good not good and gets dragged by the hands and you know goes over the the edge of the platform and Django gets out his like Batman things and and you know manages to not go all the way over and he's being like dragged down and he has to try to from one of his hands to reach the other hand to, you know, to unhook the wire thing, 
and just yeah that that whole bit was a lot of fun I think actually yes one of the problems in this also is like characters keep fighting each other and nothing actually happens like okay so I enjoy the action scene but nothing actually happened like okay by the end of it yeah I get Django leaves because he thinks that Obi-Wan is dead but he's not dead so it's like it, like the movie has this problem that it doesn't want to kill off you know it can't kill off Obi-Wan because he's in the original trilogy and it doesn't want to kill off Jango Fett yet, so it's that. And and then later in the asteroid field, there's also you know there's all the shooting. There's the the these big explosions with the the seismic charges. But there isn't actually like somehow, despite all of this, you know Obi Wan doesn't get hurt from being blasted on the platform. And his ship doesn't take significant damage despite being shot at and all these seismic charges and such. And it's just like they wanted the fight to keep going and they wanted explosions and such. But they didn't have characters that could die in the scene so his plot armor just becomes ridiculous. We'll have a couple of surprises for him. The subtitles for the hearing impaired correctly describe what Boba Fett then does as cackling. I do think it works fine that in this movie Obi-Wan Kenobi hides from Jango Fett by landing on an asteroid and then in Empire Strikes Back Boba Fett guessed that Han Solo was hiding by landing on I want to say that time it was a Star Destroyer because Jango deduced that that's the way Obi-Wan did once you know by the end of this movie you know yeah yeah when Jango lands and arrests Whatever you know, he he lands. He points his gun at, I want to say Anakin, and was Padme also there at that time? I'm not 100 percent certain. Uh, you know, yeah, somewhere around that time. You know, he also finds out that Obi Wan followed Jango to the base on Geonosis, so he deduced the only thing, the only way he could have gotten away from me, was by landing on that you know on that asteroid so he taught that to boba before he himself you know Django taught boba before Django died and so you know decades later boba was like okay so he disappeared uh-huh yeah sure and you know he he checked for that kind of thing and Django asked for a clone that was unaltered rather than going out and finding a woman to have a child with because he knew that if Boba grew up with a mother, he might end up more sensitive and empathetic. He might be more averse to violence, and that wasn't something that Django wanted to risk happening to his son. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you can't grow up emotionally healthy without having a cis woman as a mother, but I am saying Django does not have the sensitivity to raise Boba with empathy. Obviously, in real life, trans women and gay men can provide that sensitivity, can raise an emotionally healthy child. Not only cis couples can do that. I couldn't ride anymore until I healed. So you're saying I ride till I can't ride no more? Absolutely gorgeous shot when Anakin talks to a Jawa and you can see the sky in the background, the Jawa crawler off to the side. I've seen some say that they don't understand why the Trade Federation Viceroy is now this bloodthirsty guy. You know, he, has, he says he wants Padme's head on his desk. You know, I'll grant that he's a lot more bloodthirsty in this than in Phantom Menace, but it has been 10 years. He suffered a bad defeat at the end of that. Some people do change that much after such a strong event and with so many years. Like, he's had 10 years to become increasingly bitter. I do really appreciate, you know, like, hypo, he might have wanted her, like, he, he probably hated her by the end of Phantom Menace, but he's not going to stand there as he's being arrested and say, I hope you die, like, no, he's not, he's not that stupid, he's not that out of, he, he has more control of his emotions than this, but now he's talking to Count Dooku, like, you know, Dooku, 
Like, basically, Dooku is like, you know, actually, yeah, I think he said, you know, I want her head on my desk. I, I won't sign the treaty until I have her head on my desk. And Dooku's like, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get there. I do really appreciate the scene of Count Dooku and his allies talking where Count Dooku confirms, yes, supposedly the clone army is for them. You know, they, they expect to be able to muscle the Republic with the threat of the army. I don't know if Count Dooku knows that this is a lie, but certainly his allies do believe it. By the end of the movie, it really seems like the army was always for Palpatine and the Republic. This scene was apparently not su always supposed to be in the movie. Like, George Lucas wanted to keep it more of a mystery if Count Dooku was good or evil. I really like that we find have at least one scene that gives us some clarity. When Anakin confesses to Padme, this is one of the scenes that are most difficult to believe that she would still be in love with you know with him or be falling in love with him I'm not saying she would no longer love him I'm not saying she would now hate him I'm saying her love would take on the form of wanting to take care of him not wanting to be with him realistically she would try to get him psychiatric counseling which is clearly what he needs I'm not saying he should be rejected or something but he needs help I could maybe believe it if they had been together for years by this point, so she would have the whole sunk cost thing going on, but they've only just started a relationship. She only fell in love with him, what, hours ago, days ago? Had it happened by then? She certainly hadn't confessed to loving him, but she did kiss him at least once, so I guess maybe. The recording of Obi-Wan being attacked by a destroyer droid makes it look way too much like he couldn't have survived it when... Really, all it had to show was there's a destroyer there. That should be where the recording ends. Like, if you if you're watching this video and you don't remember exactly what we see, like he goes, you know, at first he's just talking, he's he's telling them, you know, okay, so I saw this, this, and this, and then, oh no, and he gets out his lightsaber, and he walks away from, you know, out of where the the uh, hologram camera is filming, and he's like deflecting shots, and then you see a destroyer. And it fires, like, I don't know, 20 rounds or something. And it's like, we've literally never seen a Jedi be okay after that many shots. Like, in Phantom Menace, when there are two destroyer droids, I mean, I could see they fire maybe 8 or 10 rounds. But then the Jedi run before more are fired. It's just, yeah. It is really badass when Padme is like, he ordered you, he did not order me, I'm going to save Obi-Wan, you want to protect me? Come along. Although it is kind of, it's the same logic as in Phantom, like, in Phantom Menace, you know, Qui-Gon is like, stay in that cockpit. Now, obviously, he meant, don't fly, just stay, you know, you're, you're probably safe in, in there, you know, and he's like, Qui-Gon told me to stay in this cockpit, so that's what I'm gonna do. And then this, you know, well, they told you to protect me. He didn't, they didn't order me to do anything, so I'm going to go to a place that's dangerous, so if you want to protect me, I guess you gotta come along. And Count Dooku comes in to appeal to Obi-Wan. I mean, let's just appreciate the incredible talent of Christopher Lee, R.I.P. Just, the, the... One of the best performances in the movie, and in, in these six movies in general, and the delivery of all these lines that, like, this guy has to, like, he's standing there, he's talking about, you know, the Senate has been infiltrated by the Dark Lord of the Sith. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know if, I guess I could try to do it. The Senate has been infiltrated by the Dark Lord of the Sith. You know, this, like, before he did the movie, he's never, like, he didn't do any other Star Wars before it. So, you know, but he can take these words and make it feel like he, like, he believes them and knows exactly what they mean. You know, this, this, just, yeah. And names like Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, you know. And he just, yeah, it, it works. I'll never join you. 
and Count Dooku like takes a moment trying to figure out how to make happen what usually happens in this kind of scenario. You know, the guy having his hand cut off and it's like, I mean, the way he's suspended, I don't know, can my lightsaber cut through that electrical stuff? And I, I, um, I am hankering to chop a, chop a hand off, maybe later. You don't know what's out there. For all you know, you could be dragging me right into easily the worst bits of comic relief I will engage in in these six movies. I do like that, like, the Geonosis aliens are basically, like, giant cockroaches, and so they live and move in a way that makes sense for that. Like, the, you know, Anakin and Padme are going through this hallway, and suddenly, like, a bunch of them just come swarming out. You know, they don't live in, like, houses the way we do. They have this hive that they all, you know, come out of. Yeah. Calm down, R2. I almost fell. I guess R2 took that as a personal challenge. and was like, oh, I guess I'll have to try harder then. I do really hate that the camera and editing make it appear that Padme is going to be, like, roasted by the thing, you know, and then it turns out it was showing a different canister. I mean, obviously, I don't want her to get hurt, but it's, just, it's a cheat. It's a movie-making cheat, and I really don't like it. Obi-Wan's going to kill me. Not according to episode 6. I'm not afraid to die. I've been dying a little every day since I started having to deliver this terrible dialogue. I truly, deeply believe that characters should literally just say what they feel because that's how human beings talk, I think. I do really like the arena scene, especially the parts where the, the, the part where the three characters fight the alien beings. And yeah, if you haven't already, definitely watch the video talking about that scene made by Jill Barrow. She has so many just great bits of analysis and, and yeah, she seems to be on top of things. She is one fast climber. Holy crap. Like seriously, watch that part again. Like she, you know, she, okay, she gets out of the, the chains and then she starts climbing up and then Anakin is like, what about Padme and Obi-Wan's like, she seems to be on top of things and he cuts and she's on the top of the, th like, the thing is like 10 meters tall and she got to the the top of it and just yeah like I don't know four or five seconds or something I, I mean most likely they didn't want to have either Natalie Portman or her stunt double spend a really long time gradually climbing and maybe they also wanted to move the scene along but like look at how tall that thing is and she started at the very bottom just yeah I have no idea who the Jedi is that is about to attack Dooku when Jango shoots him, but I thank him for the sacrifice because seeing Jango like get out, a, you know, he draws a gun from a, a thigh holster and shoots several times, and then he spins the gun on his index finger and puts the the gun back in his his thigh holster. Just so cool! I'm really glad that's in the movie because. I would 100% agree. That did not need to be in the movie. That, like, I mean, okay, I guess it's supposed to say that when Django is near Dooku, he serves as a bodyguard in addition to, you know, like, Dooku sent Django to kill Padme, you know, rather than, like, doing it himself or something. And, like, I mean, it's, it's a Jedi. Dooku... I guess they didn't want to reveal that Dooku was still proficient with a lightsaber yet, or willing to use a lightsaber to kill Jedi just yet, but no, doesn't need to be in the movie, but man, is it just like, yeah, so much, so cool, so much fun to see. For those who might not have seen it, when Jango's helmet goes flying because Mace cut it off, you can see the shadow of his head going flying out. That's why the head like doesn't drop out when Boba picks up the helmet, for example. You know, which a lot of people have joked would be really funny, which I mean in a pretty dark way, yeah, maybe a little bit, but the the ah, what's the word? Uh 
right on the tip of my tongue. I'm not going to claim, that, right, there it is. I'm not going to claim that I myself picked up on that. I, I, I forget, I think it might have been everything great about, uh, you know, Cinema Wins points out. You know, it's it's quick, but if you if you watch the movie multiple times, if you know if you if you watch that scene and you know, oh, you know, Mace Windows about to cut his head off, and you look very carefully, you can see there is a shadow of of the head. You know, the first time you watch it, you maybe don't perceive it, at least not consciously. Master Kenobi, you disappoint me. Yoda holds you in such high esteem. Surely you can do better. It's really hard for me to overstate how much fun it is hearing Christopher Lee deliver dialogue like this. And those evil smiles he pulls during some of the dueling. Just glorious. The, uh, you know, when, 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 just, yeah. It's, 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 I wish he was in more of this movie. I, I kind of wish, I mean, really, you, you could easily have had Dooku. Uh, you could have had Christopher Lee as Darth Maul, or, or as, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, George Lucas wanted Dooku to be revealed as a villain. He wanted that to be a twist. So you couldn't really have had Dooku in more of the, yeah, I don't know. I just, it's too bad, is what I'm saying. I, I really love seeing him play evil. I don't know if I love the parts of the duel between Anakin and Dooku, or the part of the duel between Anakin and Dooku where you only really see their faces lit up by the lightsabers. I'm not sure it completely nails what it's going for, but I definitely do appreciate the creative approach. And I've heard people say that they hate that even for just, I don't know, what is it, maybe 30 seconds, you don't get like a, a medium shot covering the fight so you can see exactly what the choreography is. So. It's a gutsy choice creatively. I have thoughts on Yoda fighting with a lightsaber. They will be in the next section. After Yoda says that this wasn't a victory, the shots of the army are appropriately gloomy. The exact right lighting. I mean, what is that? Like Magic Hour, maybe? And the cinematography, and of course the score with the always awesome Imperial March. Just like. That really does a good job of selling. Like, you know, Yoda says, we didn't win. This is just the beginning of a war. And then, like, ah, what's the word? Yeah, the, these shots, like, they convey, they, they tell the audience, armies are not a good thing. They, they might be a necessary evil, but war is a bad thing. You know, wars not make one great. And that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So, according to... Uh, yeah. Um, IMDb Trivia, and the DVD also has... I, f I forget which DVD special feature has it, but yeah. During rehearsals, filming of Count Dooku's lightsaber battle scenes, a small model of Yoda was used as a reference point for Christopher Lee. The model, however, was slightly altered to have vampire fangs, to which Lee's amused response was, I will not comment on that. I didn't think you'd do this to me, George. The fangs were likely a joke at Lee's expense for his performance as Count Dracula in Horror of Dracula and several other Hammer Studios horror films. And I also, like, this is like the first movie that the the actor who plays Boba Fett as a child. You no, know, it's the first movie he does, and he didn't know Christopher Lee, so he's like, "So, how many movies have you been in?" And and Christopher Lee is like, "Oh, I don't know, two hundred or something," you know, because he's yeah. But yeah, you know, if you're if you're a kid, if you don't know Christopher Lee, then you don't know that. And yeah. Yeah, according to how I'm being true, yeah. The Senate votes to give the Supreme Chancellor sweeping emergency powers to go to war against the separatist forces. This is the same ploy Adolf Hitler used to gain similar dictatorial power in mid 1930s Germany. And when Obi Wan and Anakin enter the sports bar on Coruscant to search for the assassin Zam Wessel, 
Several actors, actresses, and crew members from the Star Wars movies can be spotted, including Ahmed Best, Jar Jar Binks, Anthony Daniels, the 3PO, also visible in the crew, are R2-D2, R2-D2 handler Don B. B is, and his droid team consisting of Zeynep Zelkuk, Justin Dix, and Trevor Tai. And because he wanted to be able to identify himself during the Colosseum scene, Samuel Jackson specifically asked George Lucas if he could have a purple lightsaber. Lucas replied that Jedi lightsabers were only blue or green, to which Jackson said, yeah, but I want a purple one. And Lucas said he'd reconsider the request. And Jackson said, says he didn't know how it would turn out until he went in for reshoots, which is when Lucas showed him the scene containing his purple lightsaber. And I really appreciate it. I, I think it's... I, I understand that limitation, but I don't... Like, at this point, if it seems like... I mean, dude, you can have any color. Like, I get not giving them red, but you could have so many other colors. You know, and, and like, when I watched... The first time I watched this movie, I had played through, I would say, at least a dozen times, Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight, which, heh, <laughs> that one has a lot of colors. I, I mean, that's not a spoiler. No, it's not a spoiler. You know, in that one, it, there's not really a distinction between, you know, the, the bad guys. Most of the people who have lightsabers in it are bad guys, and... Yeah, some of them have red lightsabers, but, like, they have, you know, in addition to green and blue, there, and, yeah, green, blue, and red, there is purple, yellow, orange, I feel like there's at least one more, but I can't say with absolute certainty right now, and, yeah, you know, it makes the lightsaber duels more fun in that game, because when you're, the, the people you're fighting against, it's it's not just two different lightsaber colors, you know. Although Count Dooku is the main villain and is mentioned in the opening crawl, he does not make his first appearance until an hour and 16 minutes into the film. Now... Originally, Yoda was to come in and immediately have the fight with Count Dooku, Many of the creative team felt that was too quick of a transition for Yoda, so the audience needed to feel the power of good and evil going against each other. So Lucas added in the preamble to the fight with the blue lightning and rock folds, because of how powerful Yoda was. And let's see, so yeah, in DVD commentaries, the crew claims the fight between Jango Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi was intentionally made different from the other fights in the films, and that it focused more on the physical and hand-to-hand -hand combat, something not done in the films often. Now, let's see... Yeah, they apparently... You know, this film marks the first time Yoda used a lightsaber. Previously, the puppet had problems grasping his own lightsaber and making it look realistic, so hypothetically it could have he could have used a lightsaber in episode 5 but they you know i'm i mean essentially i don't think i'm not sure i think that we should see him use a lightsaber i feel like he's just you know he doesn't need to use a lightsaber basically and i it, it just it seems reductive to me like okay so every jedi uses a lightsaber i mean it just feels like Ah, what's the word? It, it he comes across to me as someone who wouldn't need to use one. That, that's when when I watched the original trilogy, he comes across as me to someone who wouldn't need he didn't he doesn't come across to me as oh he's just too old. He did used to use a lightsaber all the time. Now let's see yeah, you know, to me Yoda shouldn't need one, but then, you know, basically they realize, well, I mean, he can't hold the lightsaber, so they they may be figured that it would that if they made him move with a cane then it wouldn't seem like he was moving slowly and you know at the end of the day he kind of has to move slowly he's a he's a puppet he's being puppeteered he can't run you can't you can't puppet uh, run you know plain and simple so they had to make him move a little slower 
So they gave him a cane, and because of that, I now think of, oh, well, Yoda uses a cane. Like, hi I guess hypothetically, he used to be young and not need a cane, but it's just hard for me to imagine. But, but yeah, you know, it actually, they, they would have, they, they, he might have used a lightsaber in, in episode five. Yeah, I mean, it can't have been in episode six. So it must be episode five that they're talking about with, you know, oh, they could make it look realistic. There's no, why would he use a lightsaber in episode six? You know, if he, hypothetically, if he had used a lightsaber in episode five, maybe he would show Luke some moves with a lightsaber or something. But yeah, anyway. Okay, so I copied in a lot of stuff. That I'm not, oh, right. Um, Count Dooku's lightsaber prop is curved and is based on a rapier with an Arabian flair. That is really cool. I really appreciate, you know, because that is kind of a thing, like, I don't think the original trilogy needed to be more, you know, to go further with the lightsaber. Like, just the fact that, okay, so there's blue and there's green and there's red and bad guys use red, good guys use blue, and if you're headed to the dark side, you use green. You know, that, that, okay, that works, fine. But by the prequels, they needed to do something, you know, and yeah, Darth Maul has a, a staff, Count Dooku has a rapier. I'm not going to talk about what's in Ruins of the Sith, but yeah, you know, they, I, I do think that's really cool. And let's see. Reshoots were performed in March 2001. During this time, a new action sequence was developed featuring the droid factory after George Lucas had decided the film lacked a quick enough pace in the corresponding time frame. The sequence pre-visualization was rushed and the live action footage was shot within four and a half hours. I mean, I do think the, the scene came out pretty well, but yeah, at the end of the day, you can kind of like, I mean, I guess, basically, originally, they just, they go in through the door and they get captured, I guess. Okay, I get why that's, that's kind of disappointing for a Jedi and someone as bad as, as Amidala was in the first movie. Yeah, I, okay, I, I changed my mind. I actually don't particularly mind the sequence, ultimately. Jedi Master sifo was originally just a flimsy alias for Darth Sidious, known as sifo sido but a typo was made in the script. George Lucas preferred the new name, and the plot point about him was changed to make him actual Jedi who had disappeared. And... George Lucas has said as early as 1998 that Boba Fett would play a key role in this, the second episode of the prequel trilogy. At one point, the character would have been one of an army of shock troopers that would invade the Republic and ignite the Clone Wars. I do think that makes a lot of sense. That could have been really good. Let's see. Our, as the story developed, however, Lucas decided to revise the story to focus on the character of Jango Fett as the source of the Republic Army and to reduce Boba's role to that of Jango's clone son. And let's yeah, there's a bunch. Okay, I'm gonna start going through some of this. Cause this this video is already three hours long. I'm gonna let's see. Yeah, I, I copied in a bunch of stuff from, let's see, the 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 Wikipedia page for the movie and IMDb trivia. So, you know, I recommend reading those. Now, let's see, the... Yeah, so a critic pointed out that in this movie, the lead is probably Anakin or Obi-Wan or maybe Padme Abadala. But we didn't know Obi-Wan in Episode 1. Anakin is a completely different person in this movie since, you know, 10 years. Qui-Gon Jinn was probably the closest thing to a protagonist in the movie, but he died in the end, at the ending. 
and now, yeah, another thing, you know, episodes one through three are too much about selling toys and video games, which episodes four and five weren't. Episode six did get a bit, yeah. And, yeah. So, there are various aspects of Hitler's rise to power and abuses of power in this film. Palpatine and Hitler prepare war in secret while it's publicly, publicly talking about how badly they don't want war. I do think that the movies commenting on Hitler's rise to power, since so much of it is about how Palpatine and Hitler say one thing but do another and generally use confusion as tools to gain power, it loses some of its punch when there are so many things in the movie where characters will say one thing and do another and it has nothing to do with that. It's just because of the writing and directing choices, like how multiple characters are constantly trying to claim that Anakin is much younger than Padme or or Obi-Wan when he doesn't look like it. Like, in real life, Hayden Christensen and, and Natalie Portman are around the same age. Like, I forget, I think I read somewhere that they're only a few, couple of months apart in age. And we're supposed to believe that there's a 10-year age difference, and it's just, you know, because that, that clearly doesn't have anything to do with Darth Sidious gaining power. The, the fact that they don't look, that the age difference is is not but yeah anyway it's great that Padme gets a lot more action this time around and a lot cooler action than episode one you know episode one it's basically just she runs down some hallways she shoots a few droids she manages to capture the trade federation person but in this you know she fights off that creature attacking her she shoots a bunch she runs around the factory dodging and without it feeling like they changed the fundamentals of the character you know she doesn't approve of violence she's just willing to engage in it if it's absolutely necessary she believes in democracy and you know when anakin admits to killing the same people i killed them every single one of them and don't get me started on the married ones i don't mind flying but the way you fly is suicide you just jumped out of a window and grabbed onto a flying drone. That is substantially more suicidal. And also, he gets frustrated that Anakin leaps out of the flying car when that is extremely similar to him jumping out the window. I realize that doesn't sound like much. It's, you know, only two. But yeah, twice in the scene, a Jedi jumps to either grab onto or land on an enemy despite the incredibly steep drop if they miss. I get why they thought that these two drops were cool. I, you know, but... They should have been willing to kill their darlings and chosen one of them and not done the other. After, yeah, uh, after a while it stops feeling like there's any danger to them. Also, as others have pointed out, if you're going to have a Jedi jump out of a window to stop the thing trying to kill Padme, it definitely should have been Anakin, not Obi-Wan. Then it would make sense for the character doing it based on their characterization. Yes, I realize, you know, Obi-Wan said to Yoda, you know, I was, you know, he asked him something like, was I much, it, yeah, so, something like, he, he communicates, I was very, ah, what's the word, I was brash when you trained me, or something like that, you know, but it just, it doesn't make sense, and yeah, and actually, according to this movie, Yoda only trains younglings, so he shouldn't have been that brash at this point, because this was his training is complete at at this point in the in the trilogy. So he shouldn't have anyway. And and I mean he's not he doesn't make these kinds of decisions in the original trilogy. On that note, I appreciate that they did switch things up regarding the method of assassination. First, they blow up a ship, then they dump some bugs in a room. Both are visually appealing to the viewer, and both of them come close to being effective. Like, it, I really, I think the movie would have gotten really tiring if we just had scene after scene where people where people either blew things up trying to get Amidala or like tried to shoot her, and something would prevent them from hitting her. You know, something like that. Jedi business. Go about your drinks. That's honestly almost scarier than if he said almost nothing. So. If Jedi are involved, that automatically means that no civilian should care and 
at all about what's happening. They should just assume that since Jedi are involved, things were being done right. I mean, I realize this movie is being set in a fictional galaxy, but the idea of basically never challenging what in our world is cops. Wow. I get that a number of people were really frustrated when that Boba Fett was killed by accident by Han Solo when Han Solo had trouble seeing. And I appreciate that George Lucas wanted to make things right do something for the fans who've been there for him for so many years, entire decades. But making Jango Fett the genetic host for all of the clones just feels like he's trying too hard to impress those fans. The idea that they are clones is decent. It helps underline that there's no individual thought in the Galactic Empire. Now, speaking hypothetically, since in the real world we do not yet have clones of human beings, I'm not saying that clones have no humanity or could not have any humanity. But what the movie describes would only lead to obedient troops. They aren't encouraged to be human beings, they're just raised to be soldiers, so that does make a lot of sense. And it also, like, I feel like, you know, if you're watching this, you know, you may be, if, especially if you're a child when you first watch this, you maybe take away from it, it is a bad thing to be, to, to always, to, to not question orders, to just do what you're told by the military. I really wish that the banking clan alien, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be around the bush. The design of the banking clan is this racist, anti-Semitic stereotype of Jews owning banks and, you know, create, being behind the all the the wars in the world and, you know okay so here he's not alone and not all of the you know so some of the aliens resemble like like the the trade for Asian aliens still sound like Asian stereotypes but I mean and since it's since it's World War two since Palpatine is like Hitler it's especially bad since Hitler used the lie that Jews were why Germany lost World War one to drive hatred towards Jews I'm not going to spend forever on or get to work up about, but I, do th I, I don't like Yoda fighting with a lightsaber. I especially think it looks silly. Like, you know, he's so small, he has to jump high up in the air for there to be a credible duel between him and Christopher Lee. If you want, like, a credible duel, I think either it should have been that he fought someone that was his own size or... You know, he just used telekinesis or something like that. You know, I, th I think it works when he uses telekinesis like in the original trilogy. You know, that gets across that he's powerful even though he's small. But the idea that someone that small, even by leaping around like that, could fight. Like, this guy was just... Like, you know, he had an easy time fighting both Anakin and Obi-Wan, you know... I do love the dual wielding that Anakin very briefly does, but mostly that's because it's incredibly fun to do in Jedi Academy, the sequel to Jedi Knight 2, which was the sequel to Dark Forces 2, which was the first game where you play as a Jedi and the sequel to Dark Forces where you're not a Jedi. I love that game series, but boy are the titling rules weird. I appreciate that this movie tries to explain why Obi-Wan said that Yoda trained him in the original trilogy when in Phantom Menace he was being trained by Qui-Gon. So basically this movie try this movie's answer is that Yoda trained him when he was a child and then Qui-Gon took over when he was no longer a child. I don't know, I, th I feel like that works fine. Like Yoda teaches them sort of the, the basics in a, in a group and then when they, I, I don't know the exact age, I mean, they say that Anakin at age 9, that's too late to start his training, but he appears to be... Well, yeah, yeah, he's being trained by Obi-Wan at the end, starting at the end of Phantom Menace, so, like, the... the certainly... Hmm. Actually, wait, does that mean that... I'm not 100% sure if that's the, the standard SOP or if they usually anyway some you know yeah some of the time they're, they're 
maybe from when they're a teenager, they're being trained by a, uh, yeah, and an, an adult Jedi, that and and Solo, but not not by Yoda, that kind of thing. JXA points out, did I say that right? JXZ, XZ points out that tracking down Django from the Poison Dart is way too easy. 100% agreed. Lucas realized that countless viewers of Phantom Menace hated Jar Jar Binks, so he decided to make him the character that helps make sure that the Senate gives Palpatine the power that leads to him becoming the Emperor, so that it wouldn't ruin our opinion of another prominent Star Wars character or be some random person doing it. I do think that the death of his mother makes a ton of sense as something that pushes Anakin to the dark side, but why didn't he try to free her from slavery at some point? In the 10 years, you could so easily have put this into dialogue. So much of the movie is about how he's having nightmares about his mother dying. Have him bring it up to Obi-Wan who responds, We've had this conversation. Until your training is complete, you cannot get involved in such matters. Or something. I mean, it's not a surprise that she dies on such a ruthless planet where she was a slave last we saw, famously as, you know, famously an extremely dangerous life. It seems much safer to live on Coruscant, and it's clearly easy to fly between the two for the Jedi. Like, the only reason... Like, in, in Phantom Menace, they fly between Tatooine and Coruscant. Like, the one thing that they're, like, worried about is, well, you know, enemies of the... Like, Shmi doesn't have enemies, so just, yeah, like, free the slaves. Set your people free, Anakin. That's all I'm saying. I don't think it makes sense that Yoda can wield a lightsaber as well as he does. Like, you know, if he could at all, I feel like he would look like old Ben Kenobi with that thing. I mean, if he can jump around and swing a saber the way he, we see him do at the end of this movie, why does he need a cane? Why are his movements usually so slow? I mean, even if you want to say, oh, it's to lure the enemy into a false sense of security... We've seen him move slow when everyone around is a master Jedi. Does he really not trust the rest of the Jedi Council? In fact, if you wanted to have him fight like that, have little hints that he's actually faster and stronger than he usually looks. I mean, physically stronger. I'm not talking about with the Force. We know he is. Why does anyone believe that the assassin uh, targeting Padme was sent by the Separatists? I, I feel like there should have been like a another political idea or you know some some kind of law that she is you know is working on passing or trying to prevent from passing that would make it easier to understand why some people you know some characters in this believe it's the separatists it would make the movie more complicated you know harder to understand but that that fact it underlines that these movies are probably too action oriented to to tackle complex political ideas and it sucks because doing something destructive killing someone that kind of thing and then blaming a political enemy that's something fascists do you know two birds with one stone as far as eliminating potential problems to their power so it's yet another thing where clearly George Lucas wants to comment on fascism and fascistic methods which could make it easier for people who watch these movies to recognize signs of rising fascism before the fascists get too much power for even people in their own country can do very much to stop them like really I, I, I legitimately cannot figure out like, I think Mace Windu says something like, maybe it's disgruntled spice miners. We don't we don't know what the details of that are, but yeah, then it's like, oh, it's got to be the separatists. Why would it be the separatists? She's fighting to stop there from being an army of the Republic. Why would the separatists have a problem with that? Like, that's the one prominent piece of legislation that we know her opinion on. And it just, like, yeah. Like, you just, I, I get that, you know, Lucas basically knows that everyone knows that everyone who isn't 
in the Star Wars galaxy knows that Palpatine is, is Sidious. So he doesn't have to make a big deal out of him being Sidious to us. But Lucas also needs for almost no one in the Star Wars galaxy to know that Palpatine is Sidious. So, you know, he just has these ridiculous, like, this is the kind of thing that would immediately make you think, oh, whoever sent the assassin must want the army. You know, they're, they're trying to assassinate the, I mean, do we even, did they even talk about other prominent senators who are against the creation of, of, the, of the army? I'm not entirely sure that they did. So it is like, what? obviously that's what it is, like, Honestly, maybe there should have been, yeah, that's, yeah. Lucas wanted characters to be talking, you know, like when, when Padme, after the assassination attempt, you know, she's packing and she's talking about, I have not spent years fighting to make sure we do not create an army of the Republic just to watch this kind of thing, you know, I, I forget, what did she say to, just to let all that work go to waste, something like that. So Lucas wanted her to be talking about it, so it's in our minds. Padme doesn't want the military. It's a military is a bad thing. Padme's a good person. She doesn't want military. Military is something that should be avoided if at all possible. Okay. But then, like I'm I mean ultimately the movie doesn't come out and say until the very end that Sidious is behind all of this. When Tyrannus goes to meet Sidious, and Sidious says, it's all going to plan, we're like, okay, I guess it was, you know. But, it's extremely obvious that that's what's going on before that. Like, it, it's just, it's it's wild that, like, I, I think Lucas, as a writer, like, sometimes, if you're writing, if you're writing fiction, then everyone in the fiction behaves the way you want them to behave, the way you write for them to behave, you know, and I, f I feel like I've read about some authors who kind of, I mean, I, I don't know if went mad with power, that might be an excessive term, but that general idea, and yeah, it seems like Lucas doesn't really believe that you know, is like my character. The characters I write are not going to realize it, and so he doesn't feel like he has to make it credible that they don't realize it. Why does R two D two push C three PO into the droid in in the you know off the thing in the droid factory? He used to at least be trying to help. That push seems malicious. And if he can fly, why didn't he in episodes 4 through 6, except for, you know, obviously it would have been a lot more difficult to do the effects for it. And it's it's just the kind of thing that, just don't introduce it, like there's no reason for it to happen. I, I think he thought that we would, that it's cool, that we would think it was cool. And I, I do know some people do think that it is cool. But they're wrong. It's just contradictory and frustrating. They're not wrong. They're entitled to their opinion. And, yeah, when, you know, when Anakin confesses to killing the Sand People, he says that, you know, he, he hates the Sand People, and, you know, the, the music kicks in, and the Imperial March becomes the Imperial Narc. Lucky for Anakin that his, this music is non-diegetic, or or Padme would know exactly where this is going. When Anakin starts talking about how he doesn't like sand, there's this moment where Padme, like, very, like, she, you know, they're both facing forward. It's, you know, and he's like, I don't like sand. And she just turns to face him very suddenly. I, I like to think that internally she's like, is he seriously saying this? So obviously we all laugh at how the assassination attempt on Padme keeps being outsourced. Sidious sends Darth Tyrannus, who sends Jango Fett, who sends Zam, who sends a flying probe, which dispatches these little worm-like things. I like to think that if they hadn't got chopped up, we would have seen that the worms outsourced it too. Like it was going to split up, spit up something that would then kill Padme. 
So we all find it frustrating that after Padme knows she's been targeting targeted by an assassin, after her ship blows up and kills her double, that she then sleeps in a room with a window facing the outside and the only thing in the room is R2-D2. The cameras are all for any of everything. The fact that these are her decisions and not the Jedi doesn't make it okay. Obviously, there should be more security. And you know what? It's such an easy fix. Have her be in a room deep inside the building with an emergency exit that only she or the Jedi can open and only from inside. Only one door, only one other door goes in there and the two Jedi are standing in front of it. They, they have to clear anyone who goes in or out. She's alone in the room. Someone that it seems could be trusted walks up to the two Jedi, requests going in to see her. Maybe the new body double. Maybe that security guy with an eye patch. And at this point, either they just let them through, or maybe there's some kind of, like, code, password thing that fails. If you still really badly want the worms to attack her and for Anakin to slice them up, you can have her let be through, but then right after, let's say it's the body double who goes in, and, like, as soon as the door closes, they're like, you know, they call up the security guy, and they're like, I mean... Why did you say it was okay for the body double to come in? We specifically requested that no one be allowed entry. And the and the guard is like, I didn't tell her that. You know, she's right here. I'm looking at her right now. Whoever you let in is not the body double. You know, turns out it's, it's the changeling. They run into the room. Anakin chops up the worms. Padme runs out through the emergency exit. Obi-Wan tries to grab the changeling and something happens that allows her to escape. Let's say she can also change into something tiny, like whatever the Star Wars equivalent of a mouse is, and runs out, everyone chases after her, and at this point, you could still have the action proceed the same as in the movie, if you still really badly want that kind of thing. You know, if you still want the small probe, maybe that's the first thing that the changeling tries to escape on, and you know, as a mouse, and the reason that it blows up is because she uses a self-destruct function in it, and then she goes to a normal ship, Anakin catches up with her normal ship. You can even still have the bar, since George certainly loves referencing the other movies, and it's a very clear reference to the Moss Eisley Cantina. But this means that the security is much better. It uses the fact that you have a changeling assassin in the movie. It means the characters are a lot less gullible. You can even have a password test fail that just means that either the changeling assassin is unable to carry out the attack, or maybe, like, the, you know, they, they manage to, let's see, maybe, yeah, maybe she has this tiny little thing that she can throw through a tiny slit in the door that, you know, as soon as it comes through, it expands once again, yeah, once, in, once it ends in the room, then it releases the worms, voila, you can still have the chase. Because it's at this point that the changeling changes into a mouse, outruns Obi-Wan. And yes, I am aware that, you know, in the movie, let's see, Padme, yeah, Padme comes up with the idea of using herself as bait so they can find the assassin. But they don't have to be so reckless about it. Leave a trace of breadcrumbs that leads to that room, but at least put her in that room for safety. Or something equivalent. It doesn't have to be that exact thing, but it certainly can't be a window facing the outside of this, like, yeah. I understand people who think it's really cool that Sidious is so good at manipulating people when events in the prequel trilogy, and events in the prequel trilogy, but I do think it gets legitimately difficult to follow some of these movies. Again, you know, if you if you sit down and read, like, I forget, I think maybe a Wikipedia, maybe Wikipedia, actually, at some point, you know, then you get, okay, so this is why it actually worked, but we should be able to follow the movies. It's fine for this, ex you know, expanded universe stuff to go in and, like, deepen our under understanding, but it shouldn't be required reading. This is we, These are movies. We shouldn't... Homework should not be a thing, you know. Count Dooku is an entertaining enemy, but he is in the movie... He's, he's barely in the movie, and a lot of them, the time we don't even know if, like, what he says, like, when he, ah, let's see. Yes, yeah, some of what he says when he's trying to talk Obi-Wan, you know, he's, he's trying to 
manipulate Obi-Wan and like some of it is clearly true so it's like wait was the other stuff also true and obviously it is and it, you know it's it makes for an interesting villain when we don't know if he's telling the truth and you know the the let's see Yeah, the, the have and and a Sith Lord manipulating one or more good guy Jedi is an important part of episodes four, five, and six. There it's Darth Vader, and you know Darth Vader is complex, but also has an intense presence. You know Darth Maul is intense, Count Dooku is complex, and yeah, like overall, you you really could have had just one character like honestly maybe it should have been that they think that the leader of the separatists is Count Dooku everyone says you know every time someone talks about the separatist leader they refer to him as Count Dooku and for a long time like Mace you know Mace Windu is like can't be Count Dooku Count Dooku would not send an assassin He's a Jedi. That doesn't make any sense. You know, and then near the end of the movie, someone says, you know, like, yeah, like Django says to Obi-Wan, personally, I don't care if you live or die. I don't. But it's not up to me. It's up to Count Dooku. And, you know, the, the swivel chair turns to face. And, you know, and we see that it's actually Darth Maul. And Obi-Wan is like, Maul. And and Maul responds something like the if people when when people think that I'm actual that that the leader of the separatists is actually Count Dooku, who I killed, by the way, that makes it a lot easier for you know to, to manipulate you know whatever. There's there's always a reason for that kind of thing. But yeah, like it, it's it's just you have such an incredibly cool design in Phantom Menace and then he dies so cool you know he he doesn't get to be in more than you know he's yeah he's not in this movie at all and then you have such an, an actor who's so good at delivering this dialogue and and pretending to be evil as Christopher Lee and then he's barely in this movie like it's just it's it's just really frustrating, and and at the end of the day, like, I could understand. I I, I'm not sure I know anyone personally, but I'm sure there are people out there who think that the Emperor is not in episodes five and six enough. I personally disagree. I think it's the right amount because throughout episode six, it feels like he's in control. Like he only loses at the very very end. Like you know, he's the the trap he sets up very nearly works. It's only because he couldn't quite manipulate Luke that he fails, you know. And, you know, the the hubris, which is Greek for hubris, to actually tell the you know, he, he put out the oh yeah, there's a there's a uh, what's it called? There's a on on the forest moon of Endor there is a shield generator and you know it's like I'm gonna put I'm gonna put so many troops near that shield generator. Why didn't you just tell them that the shield generator was somewhere else, so that even if they defeated your troops, they, you know, they still wouldn't know where the shield generator. You know, but I think you can read that as just he he thinks they're gonna win. He thinks it's there's no way the good guys can win. You know, but I I do think that the the emperor has a strong enough presence in episode six. Let's see. I mean, episode five just. He's mentioned in episode four. Episode five, we don't see him for that long, but it just sets up he's there. He's going to be a big deal in episode six. And I, I feel like he has a strong enough presence in episode six, but I really don't think Count Dooku has enough screen time and just, like, don't get me wrong. He is intense, and he's, like, you, you really don't want to get in a lightsaber fight with him. But... 
it's I, I don't think it's enough. He doesn't dominate the movie the way Sidious do dominates episode 6. And Maul, like, I appreciate... I do think, you know, it sucks that the marketing gave it away, but I do think his the reveal when he takes off the the hood and you see the horns, like you, you hadn't gotten a really good look at his entire head before that point, and then he uses the both, you know, like he uses the entire staff of the saber, where earlier it kind of looked like his handle was like really long, you know, comparatively, but, you know, it's like, oh, okay, whatever, that's what, no, he has two, you know, it was all over the trailer, so everyone knew long before watching the movie that he's gonna, you know, he's got horns and and he's got a dual blade lightsaber. But it's a cool reveal, but again, he doesn't really dominate the movie. I do really like, though, here at least, there is an emotional connection. Like, you know, that the big problem with Darth Maul, the one problem with Darth Maul, I love Darth Maul, but... In Phantom Menace, I'm not talking about Expanded Universe. The one thing is there's really no emotional connection between... Like, okay, at the very, very end, when Obi-Wan defeats Maul, he is getting revenge for Qui-Gon. No problem there. But when, before that point, when it's the three of them fighting each other, like, I mean, he's the bad guy, but that's it. We don't know anything about him other than he's a Sith, and, like... You know, I, I I mean, I don't even think the, the good guy characters even learn his name. You know, no nobody says it. So, so yeah. You know, Sidious, you know, my apprentice doth Maul. So, you know, the Trade Federation people know. But, yeah, the one thing is there's no emotional connection, which there is in all of the original trilogy. And in this, I mean, could be stronger. But when, you know, I mean, Anakin straight up says... You're going to pay for all the Jedi you killed today, Dooku. You know, that's a motivation. That's that's a personal, you know, it's not some, like, oh, he's he's killed people. No, he killed Jedi. He, he is the reason that all these Jedi died. You know, it must have been dozens of Jedi that died. Because apparently there were, like, 100 or 200 at first. And they're at the end when they're all surrounded. I mean, what is that? A dozen, maybe two dozen left? So, like, that's an insane amount of, of people to die. And, yeah, he, he wants revenge. That makes sense. And Obi-Wan, I mean, I could imagine that, like, he probably hates the idea that Count Dooku and Qui-Gon Jinn, like, that, you know, the, like, he says, Qui-Gon would never join you, and, and Dooku seems sure of it. And it's... It's this thing, like, again, like, I don't know. I wish this movie said, this this movie made clear, would Qui-Gon really have joined him? Because, it, again, at the end of the day, I would argue, by the end of Episode 6, we know the answers to most of the important questions in Episodes 4, 5, and 6. You know, we, we know... Yeah, we, we know enough, like... Don't, I would definitely have an issue with it if, by the end of Episode 6, we didn't know for sure if Anakin Skywalker was Darth Vader, was Luke's father. I think that would be a huge problem. But, yeah, by the end of this, like, it's still... Wait, I don't know, would he have joined him? I, the, the, all this stuff was just... Yeah. And... Right, so, yeah, the Geonosis arena, you know, the, the fighting of the creatures is supposed to be a sort of public execution. Uh, you know, I strongly disagree with the people who said that it doesn't make sense. You know, that that's how the executions carried out. You know, first of all, public executions, in as gruesome and painful ways as possible, is frequently used by cruel dictators to keep people in line. You know, that... Like, it's one thing, I'm, I mean, if, you, if you're a believer, if you are certain that what you're fighting for is right, then, like, is being shot, that's not necessarily gonna, you know, bother you. Like, you might, I mean, 
I forget. I, th I think there's a, a quote from a famous freedom fighter who literally said, you know, okay, so if they catch me, they'll shoot me. If they don't catch me, they might shoot me as I'm, you know, if they, if they spot me, they'll shoot me. Either way, I'm dead. I might, you know, I might as well. Uh, what was the third thing? What was the middle thing? If they, if I do nothing, they still kill me. You know, I'll still die because it's a dictatorship. So I might as well, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bullet. It's quick. It's, I mean, if, if you're shot in the head, you don't even feel it. You die before the, the sensation of pain. But if an, if a vicious animal eats you in, like, think about how painful and how slow that must, like, Holy crap, that just, yeah. So I, I definitely think it, it makes sense. And you got to remember, when they start off that thing, there's just, there, okay, there's there's two Jedi, and then there's a senator. And they, I mean, they have them surrounded, you know. Dooku is there with his lightsaber, you know. the At the time, there aren't a ton of battle, you know. Th this is before the battle droids enter the arena. But, you know, that does happen. And the, what's the word? You know, yeah, Django is up there with his weapons and equipment. You know, the, the, they don't really have a good reason to expect the, the execution to not work. Actually, now that I think about it, see, I, the, the action scenes just wash over you. Let's see, I think it's maybe something like, First, the the three of them free, yeah. They 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 free themselves and they get they either kill or or subdue the animal that they're dealing with. Is that when the battle droids first enter, or is that when the Jedi? I honestly I don't remember. And again, I'm not actually expecting. I know you can't answer me right now. You can put it in the comments, but yeah. And anyway, the the yeah, are aren't the aren't the battle droids sent in to stop the, and then later the super battle droids are sent in. I do really appreciate that, you know. Ultimately, like I could understand the the an argument for saying there should be more new robots in in this, but. I do think that it's really cool that you know we already we had the battle droid we had the droid decus slash destroyer droid now we have the super battle droid which I don't think they actually refer to it as that in this movie but you know Star Wars Battlefront 2 from 2005 that's what they're called and yeah like it is uh it's a cool look it's a cool what's the word like the ah like you, you get that these are stronger and tougher, and you know they shoot faster and and such. I've seen some people joke that the younglings training lightsabers could severely injure each other standing so close to each other. You shouldn't give weapons to children. I, I, you know, one hundred percent. You should never give a weapon to a child, and you know, if at all you can avoid, like if okay, like let's say that you're being attacked. And the child having a gun could save lives, maybe, but that's an extreme and unusual circumstance. But otherwise, don't give weapons to children. But that scene, considering that we don't see these lightsabers cut through anything, I would 100% guess that they are some kind of safe version. Like, they probably can't cut anything. They're probably not actually hot. They just look like it. You know, yeah, we see them, you know, they can use them to, like, you know, the the... The the draw yeah, the training droid thing you know will fire a little laser blast and they'll like deflect it with a lightsaber but we don't even know if that's a dangerous blast like it's I I my guess would be the the thing that fires off like hypothetically if they don't deflect it maybe they don't even feel it like it's it's I don't know it's it's maybe like uh uh getting ah uh, let's see. Like, like someone softly throwing a rice grain at you or something. And the lightsabers, it's it's barely just, they're, they're mimicking the movements. You know, like, like how before you start actually driving a car, 
you you learn how you know you don't just put someone in a car and then recite a bunch of instructions at them you you know so yeah with that said I understand making the joke I do you know again dark comedy but it, it is you know if you I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that it's not funny the the idea that they're standing there with dangerous weapons and yeah anyway that was it for this one so if you like this video please comment thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists a suggested video you're gonna watch on the screen right about now I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie and recently these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.